Welcome! This is Fast Track to Adobe Captivate 6 video tutorial series. My name is Anita Horsley and I'm an e-learning instructor, designer, and developer. I use Adobe Captivate as my primary e-learning authoring tool because it's a progressive tool that's fun, easy to use, and yet sophisticated and leading edge. What you're seeing right now is part of the exercise file that you'll be building during this course for practice. Adobe Captivate is used to create interactive content and or simulations and video tutorials using computer procedures. Adobe Captivate 6 has many new features such as improved quiz properties, advanced interactions, smart shapes, characters, high definition video, HTML5 publishing, and many other enrichments that help improve your e-learning workflow. And you'll be learning many of these functions in this series. This video course will fast track your basic skills in using Adobe Captivate 6 practically and functionally. And I'll be teaching you about the fundamentals of getting started using Adobe Captivate, how to add and manage your slides, how to add content using standard and interactive objects, and how to manage your objects and assets, how to add and edit media such as audio, video, and simulations, and what you'll need to know before publishing and publishing your finished projects. Overall, the goal of this course is to make you a better e-learning developer by mastering the basic skills first. But even if you've used earlier versions of Captivate, you'll still pick up value and helpful tips from this course. Each tutorial is fairly self-contained, but the course is designed to be watched as a whole sequentially. At the end of most lessons, there's a short exercise designed to help you recall the information you just learned and apply it when you're on your own. The exercise files allow you to follow along and practice the step-by-step -step procedures of what you're learning. Now, if you do plan on using the exercise files, I recommend downloading them and placing them in a location that you'll be able to access easily, for instance, on your desktop and name the file something like Captivate Exercise Files. Here's a quick tip. Captivate runs more smoothly and is more stable when used from your hard drive rather than a server. So I recommend placing them on your desktop. Then double click each folder to reveal the content or the subfolders. Even if you don't use the exercise files, don't worry, you'll still be able to learn just by following along or using your own files or whatever method works best for you. You've probably already figured out I'll be covering a great deal of information in a short amount of time. This course will move fast. However, the beauty of a video tutorial is that at any moment you can pause, rewind, and replay again. So you can actually go at your own pace. When you've successfully completed and mastered these basic skills, be sure to move on to more sophisticated features such as advanced quizzing, variables and advanced actions, advanced audio and video techniques, accessibility features, widgets, and aggregating projects. There's always more to learn using Adobe Captivate. So let's get started and dive into the first lesson, which is e-learning, preparing, and planning. Adobe Captivate 6 has the ability to create and publish for both e-learning and m-learning content. So it's important you understand some basic concepts and planning for these online courses. Let's get started with some definitions. Wikipedia defines e-learning as various kinds of electronic media and information and communication technology in education. It can be self-paced, asynchronous learning, or maybe instructor-led synchronous learning. E-learning is suited to distance learning and flexible learning, but it can also be used in conjunction with face-to-face -face teaching, in which case the term blended learning is commonly used. Although related to e-learning educational technology and distance education, M-learning is distinct in its focus on learning across contexts and learning with mobile devices such as handheld computers, MP3 players, notebooks, mobile phones, and tablets. The objective of M-learning is to provide the learner the ability to assimilate learning anywhere at any time. Knowing whether you are publishing your Captivate project for mobile devices or computers will make a difference in how you plan your courses. You wouldn't build a house without an architectural plan. Developing an online course has the same concept. Creating and executing a plan is the most important step in an effective development process. 
This lesson covers how to prepare for developing your course before even opening Captivate. If you follow these steps, your process will be more efficient and less stressful. Knowing your audience is important in the design process, and you should know what you want your audience to be able to accomplish once the course is complete. In other words, what are the objectives of the course? Working backward from your objectives will help you keep on track. Also, make sure your students knows those objectives right up front. The what's in it for me factor can help your students stay motivated and on track. Storyboarding can be called the blueprint of your course building process. Creating a storyboard should be the very first thing you do. Storyboarding helps organize your materials, particularly if you plan to include interactivity in games. Creating a storyboard involves simply drawing blocks on a page that represent the frames of your course. This will help you visualize the sections of your program and identify kinks in the flow. You can create a storyboard using PowerPoint, Excel, or a Word document. You'll want to include images, media, text, interactivity, and narration for each slide. Once you've created your storyboard, you can move on to script writing. The problem with many e-learning programs is that developers have simply taken their existing text-based teaching or PowerPoint projects and copied it into an e-learning authoring tool. The course consists of the student reading text and then clicking on an arrow to proceed to the next page. You have to use some text, but you can do it responsibly and in conjunction with multimedia and or interactive tools, and you'll increase the chance of your students actually learning something. There are two forms of script writing, one for the content on the slide and the other for the audio narration. The power of audio is often overlooked, but the combination of the written and spoken words can have a big impact on recall and retention for your students. People learn by hearing, seeing, and doing, so it's a good idea to plan on implementing interactivity and or games into your e-learning course. There are several ways to do this. One is to provide a variety of quiz or knowledge check questions throughout the course. You can also use training simulations, providing instructional cues to the user to select the appropriate outcome. Another method is using problem-solving activities that involve applying the knowledge learned to a situation or a set of circumstances presented in the course. This may be in the form of a puzzle, scenario, or other situational-based event. By approaching each topic in your projects with creativity in how you convey the information it can really help to increase the effectiveness of your training and make it memorable. Captivate 6 has a variety of tools to incorporate into your course, such as animations, videos, training demonstrations and simulations, and if done correctly, these features can make your e-learning project interesting and notable. Let's talk a little bit about creating a style guide. If you don't already have one, creating and using the style guide will save you a lot of time during the development process. A style guide is a reference document that includes rules and suggestions for writing style and document presentation specific to the branding of your organization. Developing a style guide can be a productive experience and the document can take less time to produce if you have collaboration with members in your department. It may include such things as font size, logos, colors, borders, themes, etc. Adobe Captivate 6 has some wonderful new themes and it's easy to create and save customized styles and themes. Having a style guide gives your courses a consistent and professional look and feel. More importantly, it allows your audience to identify with your courses and focus on the content. Finally, you have to take into consideration how your course will be published, delivered, and managed. If you don't already have one, it's a good idea to create an e-learning implementation team with your organization so that these matters are being addressed before you begin developing your courses. By extending Captivate's capabilities, Adobe has created a versatile development tool. E-learning and M-learning authors can easily develop complex content such as soft skill and physical task simulations, scenario-based instruction, and performance support systems using Adobe Captivate's interactive and multimedia tools. Remember, your goal in developing a web-based course is to teach someone something that hopefully they'll retain and apply into their lives and or careers. Plan your course wisely and you'll accomplish your goals and objectives. Now that you know how to plan your e-learning project, 
Let's get started into learning the fundamental features of Adobe Captivate's global settings in the next lesson. Okay, you've downloaded Adobe Captivate. So where is it? If you're on a Mac, go to the Applications window and click on the drop-down for Adobe Captivate 6. You'll notice this is where all of the Adobe Captivate 6 material lives. And about the third icon down is the Adobe Captivate 6 icon. Double-click on it, open Adobe Captivate. If you're on a PC, go to your Windows and select Adobe Captivate and double-click on the icon. If you want to know where Captivate lives on your PC, go to your C drive, Program Files, click on the Adobe folder, and then click on Adobe Captivate 6. Knowing some best practices to use in Adobe Captivate 6 will fast-track your future Captivate projects, saving you needless and wasted time in changing the settings for every individual project. So when you first open up Captivate, you get this welcome window. So first, let's take a look at the global settings by going up to the top toolbar and selecting Adobe Captivate Preferences. Or if you're on a PC, select Edit Preferences. As you can see, when the Preference window opens, you'll be in the Global Preferences General Settings dialog box. There are three checkboxes at the top that are not checked off by default. I like to have all three of these boxes checked. You definitely want to check the Backup Project checkbox, because if for some reason your project terminates, you can recover the file using the .bak or backup file just by removing the .bak. From here, you can also decide where you want to publish your project. Adobe Captivate is a powerful software that draws a lot of memory, so it's more stable to work from your computer's hard drive rather than a server. However, you can save your Captivate projects, assets, and publish your projects to a server. The project cache is like your computer's memory, so when you open a Captivate file, your computer remembers it, and it will open faster because of the cache. However, if you work with multiple projects, the cache can use up your system's resources, slowing your computer down. So periodically, it's a good idea to clear the cache by clicking the Clear Cache button. Adobe Captivate comes with Adobe Captivate Reviewer that can be shared with someone that doesn't have Adobe Captivate software, but they can comment on your project. If you're going to use this process, you'll need to create a folder that the reviewer's comments will be stored in here. And you have some spelling preference options and confirmation message options that you can change globally here also. On the left side of this dialog box under Category, underneath the General Settings, there's a Default tab. Click on that, and you'll notice these are the default settings for the slide. I don't typically feel the need to change these first several settings, but you should know that you have the option to change them here in your Global Settings or in each individual project. I do like to change the object defaults to display for rest of slide. I find that changing these object defaults to display for rest of slide saves me a huge amount of time in my workflow, but you need to change every single one of them that has that option. On the left side under category, you also have some recording settings. The default settings work fairly well, but you'll be learning more about the recording preferences in section six. Okay, so let's exit out of this box and look at the Help option in the top toolbar. Here you'll find access to various online Adobe Captivate related resources. And on the bottom left of the Welcome window, you can access more online resources here, as well as tutorials. If you've had projects open previously, the next time you launch Captivate, they will automatically appear on the left side of the Welcome window. You can also open any Captivate file by clicking Open and browsing for your project on your computer. The right side of the Welcome window under Create New shows you the various types of projects you can create using Adobe Captivate. We'll be going over many of these during this series. For now, let's open a new blank project. As you can see, a new blank project window allows you to choose the size of your project, either by clicking the Custom button to create a custom size, or selecting the drop-down and choosing a predefined size. All major HDTV broadcasting standards include a 720p format, which has a resolution of 1280 by 720, 16 by 9 ratio, which is what I'm recording in now. 
However, if you're publishing to an iPad, you may want to choose 1024 by 768. Or maybe you're publishing to a learning management system, in which case you may want to choose 800 by 600 or smaller. The resolution size typically depends on the audience you are publishing to. One of the new features of Adobe Captivate 6 is that when publishing a project, you have the option to use scalable HTML content, which means that your project will scale to whatever size your student's monitor is. There are pros and cons for scaling your project, but if you're going to choose scalable, you'll get better resolution creating a large project that may have to scale down versus a small project that may have to scale to a larger size. You'll be learning more about this in Section 8. Remember, it's a good idea to change some of the default features in the global preferences so that any new project you create will have those settings. Be advised that the global preferences settings will not apply to open or previously created projects, so you probably want to get familiar with this quickly and decide which global preferences you like. Now it's your turn. Using your section exercise document that's located in the Documents folder, Follow the instructions to practice what you just learned in this lesson. In the next lesson, you'll become familiar with Captivate's interface. If you've done your exercise from the previous lesson, you should have your first blank project opened. In Adobe Captivate, the interface is made up of panels, icons, windows, and toolbars. And how you arrange these items on your screen is called a workspace. So in this lesson, I'll be showing you the names, locations, and a little bit about the function of the panels in the classic view. The more familiar you are with how the interface is arranged, the easier it will be for you to determine the type of workspace you want to work with. So when you open a project for the first time, the classic workspace will be showing. This is in the upper right hand corner. And as you can see, there are various other default workspaces. For now, I'll be keeping it the classic workspace. So let's take a look and see how the classic workspace is set up. The center of the screen is called the stage, and this is the main area where you'll be editing your objects on the individual slides. The menu bar at the top of the screen goes horizontally across and provides access to all of Captivate's functions. In Captivate, there's typically more than one way to do the same function. If you ever forget where something resides, go back to the menu bar to locate it. Below the menu bar is the application bar. Since I'm on a Mac, the application bar is below the menu bar. But if you're on a PC, the menu bar and the application bar will be combined. In the application bar, you can move your slides up and down by using the arrows or changing the number. You can also change your stage view by selecting the drop down and select a different percent, say 100%. You can easily go back to fit to stage by selecting one of the keyboard shortcuts. Control or Command 0 is best fit. Control or Command 1 is 100% or Control or Command 2 is 200%. If you forget the keyboard shortcuts, you can always go back up to the drop down. Below the application bar is the main options toolbar, or otherwise known as a control panel. These set of icons are shortcuts to popular Captivate functions. When you roll your mouse over the icon without clicking it, it will provide you with the tooltip for the function. On the left hand side of your screen, from top to bottom, is the object toolbar. These icons are used to assist you in drawing, importing, and editing objects on your slides. To the right of the object toolbar is the film strip panel. You can see all your slides in your current project in this panel. At the bottom of your screen is a panel group. The timeline is an important panel because it allows you the ability to change when your objects enter and or leave the stage. And also docked in this panel is your master slides panel. And you have a number of content master slides. On the right hand side of your screen, you have four panels grouped together. The Properties panel provides all the pertinent information for the selected object on the slide. The library stores all your imported objects so that you can reuse them in the current or other projects. The Quiz Properties allows you to change the settings for quiz objects, and the Project Information provides you with the file size and some other important information. So what you've learned in this lesson is the terminology of Captivate's interface and a little bit about where the toolbars and panels are located and what they're used for. In the next lesson, we'll be taking a look at how to customize and save workspaces. 
None of the default workspaces shows every panel. There are always other functions available to you. Captivate's workspace is flexible and you may want to change it to suit your personal needs. So now you'll learn how to move panels around, expand, contract, and close panels, and customize and save your workspaces. Captivate offers several ways to expand and contract panels. As I mentioned earlier in the classic view, the film strips on the left. One way to contract it is to double click on the dark gray part of the panel at the top. For instance, to expand it, double click again. Now take a look at the properties panel on the right. Another way to expand or contract is to right click on the title of the panel. When I right click on it, I can select collapse and you'll notice that all four panels shrink down to icons. A third way to contract the panels is to choose the tiny double arrow in the right hand corner of the panel. Click it again to expand. Going back over to the Filmster panel on the left, watch as I expand the panels by physically dragging it out. I can place my mouse above the vertical line that separates the film strip from the stage area until the mouse pointer turns to a double arrow. Click and drag the vertical separator to the right until the film strip covers more space. When you do this, you can get a better view of all of your slides in your project as columns. As I mentioned earlier, not all functions are showing in the workspace. Some are hidden. So if you want to add more panels into your workspace, go to the window menu in the main toolbar at the top of your screen. This is the source of all the available panels that exist in Captivate. As you can see, the check marks indicate the panel is already open. If you want to remove the panel from the workspace, you can click on the check mark and the panel will be hidden. Let's add slide notes to our panel. Click on Window, Slide Notes, and you'll notice that it gets added onto the bottom panel to the right of the timeline. Another way to close a panel or a set of panels is to right click on the title of the panel and select Close Tab Group. For instance, if I right click on the timeline in the panel and select Close Group, you'll notice that all the panels are removed. But if I go back up to Window and select Timeline again, the group of panels will return. If you have specific needs and want to move panels around, Captivate allows you to do that manually also. For example, the slide notes that's currently set at the bottom can be moved by placing your mouse onto the slide notes tab at the top of the panel, click and drag it to where you want it, then release your mouse. You can also click and drag a panel out of the dock and make it a floating panel. If you want to move a floating panel back to a docked location, Move your mouse over the top of the panel and click and drag it to the side of a panel until you see a blue line. That blue line signifies that it can be docked there and you can let go of your mouse. Okay, I'm going to reset my classic workspace. Go up to the workspace switcher and select Reset Classic. As you can see, it goes back to the way it was before. So let's say you are going to add some panels back into your workspace and you want to save a customized workspace. So let's go back up to the main toolbar, click on the window menu. One of my favorite panels is the slide notes because if you're adding narration and or closed captions to your project, you'll need this panel. Another favorite panel of mine is the align panel. Using the align tools can save a lot of time aligning the objects on your slide. It appears at the top of your screen below the control toolbar. And let's just say you're not going to use a quiz, so you don't need the quiz properties panel. So you can close it by right clicking on the panel and selecting close. But let's say you're happy with this workspace. So go to the workspace switcher and select new workspace. Name your workspace and click OK and it will now appear within the workspace switcher. But what if you decide to change your custom workspace? So I'll add the quiz properties panel back in by selecting window quiz properties. In order to save this workspace now, select the workspace switcher and select new workspace. Type in the exact same name and click OK. A pop-up will show up asking you if you want to replace the old one. Click yes. If you want to delete or change the name of your custom workspace, go to the workspace switcher and select manage workspace. Make sure you highlight the title and then it will give you the option to rename or delete the workspace. You can easily switch between the workspaces by clicking on the drop down in the workspace switcher and select the workspace you want to change to. As I mentioned earlier, Captivate has set up some default workspaces for you. Now take some time to practice moving panels around and create and save customized workspaces. 
In the next lesson, we'll be going over opening, saving, and closing files. Now that you understand how to open a blank project from the welcome screen and how to navigate the workspace, you should be familiar with opening and saving projects. I'll be introducing you to the properties, timeline, and library panels, and I'll be showing you how to preview and close projects. To open previous projects, go to File in the main bar at the top and select Open. Navigate to the file you want to open. If you want to open more than one file, you can by selecting your Command Control key and selecting as many files as you want. As you can see, Captivate opens multiple files and you can easily switch between them. To save your project for the first time, go to File, Save As, browse to where you want to save it, and name it. Captivate does not automatically save, so it's a good idea to get in the habit of saving your files frequently. If the Save icon is grayed out, the project is saved. If the icon is not grayed out, that means you have made changes to it and should save it. If you have multiple files open that you've already named and saved, you can save them all at once by going to File, Save All. Okay, let's talk about some important panels. I'll be discussing these panels in more detail in their respective sections, but I want to introduce you to the timeline at the bottom, the properties, and the library panels on the right-hand side of your screen. The library to the right of the properties panel is where all your assets, such as audio, images, video, and presentations live once you've imported them. For now, suffice it to say, once you add your assets to your file, you can find, view, and reuse them from within the library. Okay, let's go to the Properties panel to the left of the library. There's a few suggestions that apply to all objects and slides. If you select a slide or an object on your slide, you can view and change its specific properties in the Properties panel. These properties are specific to whatever object or slide you have selected. If you want to select more than one slide or more than one object on your slide, you can change certain shared properties. Okay, let's move to the timeline at the bottom of the panel. The timeline is used to change when objects come and go from your slide. You can drag the object from within the timeline to where you want it, either by dragging the entire object or selecting one end or the other. You can also change the timing of the object from within the properties panel. The timeline also serves as a layering function. Objects at the bottom of the timeline are layered underneath. For instance, if I click and drag the bottom image to the top, you can now see the top image. There are a few options for previewing your slide. One way is to click the play icon on the timeline. So another way of previewing is to go to the preview icon in the application bar at the top. Click on the tiny drop down to view your options. My favorite way is to use my keyboard shortcuts and probably my most common shortcut key is command or control F10. Preview next five slides. Now let's say you've made all the changes you want to make and you want to exit out. If you're on a Mac, you can use your Command Q key. If you're on a PC, you're going to click the X icon in the upper right hand corner. So now it's your turn. Open up your completed exercise file, explore the timeline, the properties panel, and the library, preview the project, and save the project as a different name. Then close the file. In the next lesson, I'll be going over how to create certain types of projects. Captivate is a versatile tool with many options for creating various types of projects. Being familiar with these types of projects will help you determine the best method for creating your e-learning project. In this lesson, I'll be going over how to create a new project from a PowerPoint presentation and how to create an image slideshow. In Section 6, you'll learn how to create a software simulation and a video demo. Creating projects from templates and aggregator projects are more advanced topics and will not be covered in this series. To create a new project from the welcome window, select Project from Microsoft PowerPoint. Then find and select the file you want. The name of the PowerPoint file is automatically used for the default name of the Captivate project. You can enter the width and height you want. The default size of typical PowerPoint presentations is 960 by 720, or you can use a preset size. Captivate does a nice job of preventing images from looking stretched if you click Maintain Aspect Ratio. You can import the entire project, or you can clear all and just select the specific slides you want to add. If you select on mouse click, Captivate will add a transparent click box over every slide and the student must click the slide to advance. If you choose this option, make sure you have clear instructions for the student so they know to click the slide. Or you can choose advanced slide automatically. 
which is what I typically choose. A linked file means that if you make changes to the PowerPoint within Captivate or to the original, it will make changes in both places. If you're using a PC, you'll have the option to select High Fidelity. Captivate 6 provides support for certain PowerPoint features in .pptx, such as smart art, animations, certain text, and object effects. Check the high fidelity box to have these included in the import. Then click OK. When the pop-up comes up, it's telling you that the dimensions of the PowerPoint are not the same as the Captivate file, but quality is typically corrected upon publishing, so just click Yes. Once the PowerPoint is imported, if you linked it, slide labels, slide notes, and audio files are brought into the initial report, but will not be updated if changes are made later. You can, however, edit the content of the slide, and it will update in both places. You can find your PowerPoint in the library. If you right-click it, you can edit the PowerPoint from within Captivate, and when you save the changes, both the Captivate file and the original will be updated. If you've linked your project to the PowerPoint, the green circle means that it is synced. If the circle turns red, either changes have been made to the PowerPoint or the PowerPoint has been moved from the original folder on your computer. Just click on the red circle to resync. Although converting a PowerPoint presentation into a Captivate file is fairly quick and easy, just transferring the information into an e-learning course without taking into account students' interactions may not be conducive to students learning and applying the information successfully. In future sections, you'll learn how to add standard and interactive content to your projects. Okay, now let's move on to another type of project, creating an image slideshow. With an image slideshow, you are selecting a folder of images to create a new project. Go up to File, New Project, Image Slideshow. Select a preset size from the menu or enter your own. Click OK. Find and select the images you want to add, then click Open. If your images are larger than the dimensions of the project, you'll get this dialog box that gives you certain options. Fit to Stage shrinks the image to the largest size that will fit the slide. Crop lets you crop the image for a better fit. Here you can keep constrained proportions checked. If you want to make the frame stay the same aspect ratio as the slide. You can also click Apply All if you want to use the same sizing specifications for all the images being imported, or you can click the arrow to go to the next image and make specific edits to that image. Then click OK. Although this is a quick and easy way to create a slideshow, and there may be times to use this type of project, here's a caution. Once you click OK, these images become part of the background, which increases the size of the images. Take a look in your library and notice the size of the images. Now watch what happens if I select Insert Image and insert the same image. I can right click on the image to find it in the library. The size of the image is considerably lower. It's a good idea to keep image resolution as low as possible to avoid bloating the size of the entire project, especially if your students live in remote areas where internet speed may not be as fast. So take some time now to create two new projects import a PowerPoint presentation, and create an image slideshow. You can choose to save these or not. There are other types of projects that you can create, and some of these we'll be going over in later sections. For now, let's focus on the next section, which discusses how to add and manage your slides. In the last lesson, you were introduced to creating PowerPoint and image projects where the slides were created for you. Now we're going to look at creating your own slides, which are the building blocks of your project. In this section, you'll learn how to insert new slides and how to manage these slides using the Properties panel, Slide Notes, Master Slides, and Themes. This lesson will cover inserting a new content or blank slide, adding question slides, and inserting a PowerPoint slide. To insert a content slide, go to the menu bar at the top and select Insert New Slide. You'll notice that it inserts a blank slide on your film strip from the master slide. If you want a blank slide with no background, select Insert Blank Slide. You can also insert New Blank Slide From and choose any of these master slide templates that have preset placeholders on them. We'll go into depth on adding content onto a slide in the next section. But you should know that with these placeholders, you can quickly insert content by clicking on one of the icons in the placeholder. For example, if I click on this image icon, I can find my image and place it right in that placeholder. 
If you want to duplicate a slide, select the slide, right click on it and select duplicate. Or you can use your command or control D key. It will duplicate everything on the slide, including the content. Let's say you want to insert a blank slide with the same master template, but not the content. Select the slide in the film strip and select Shift Command V or go to your menu bar and click Insert New Slide. It will insert a new slide with the same template but without the content of the previous slide. To add a question slide, go to the main toolbar at the top and select Insert Question Slide. The Insert Questions pop-up will open and you can bulk produce question slides if you like. Then click OK. We'll be looking at question slides, quiz properties and quiz preferences in more detail in Section 5. In the previous section, I went over creating a full PowerPoint presentation. Importing and editing an individual PowerPoint slide is very similar. So go to Insert PowerPoint Slide and the Import Slides window will pop up. Select the slide you want the PowerPoint to go after and then click OK. Browse to your PowerPoint and select it. After it imports, you'll get the option of including all the slides or clear all the slides and select only the slide you want. Choose Advanced Slide Automatically, and let's keep the PowerPoint linked to the original. This keeps the file size down and allows for editing. If you're using a PC, also select High Fidelity, then click OK. By default, PowerPoint projects are 960 by 720. No matter what size your Captivate project is, you'll get a message that states the sizes are different. Captivate, however, does a good job of converting the PowerPoint on publishing, so click Yes. The on-screen images in Captivate might look a bit grainy, but the compile project looks sharp. You'll notice slide notes, audio, some animations, and slide names carry over into Captivate. But if you want to edit the PowerPoint, go to the library under the Presentation folder, and you'll notice there's a green button. This tells you that your PowerPoint is in sync with the source. To edit, right-click PowerPoint and select Edit Microsoft PowerPoint. If you're on a PC, PowerPoint will open right in the Captivate interface, allowing you to edit the presentation using all the tools and features of PowerPoint without leaving Captivate. On a Mac, PowerPoint opens in a separate window and loads the presentation, so when you exit, you get a pop-up asking you if you want to re-import the PowerPoint back into Captivate. Now that you know how to insert slides into your Captivate project, go to your Section Exercises document and follow the instructions for your practical exercise. In the next lesson, we'll be talking about slide properties. As we continue to discuss the slides, slide properties provide individual and shared properties that will assist in making your understanding of Adobe Captivate features more functional. In this lesson, you'll learn about the Slide Properties panel, Shared Properties, and Slide Notes. When you select a slide in the Film Strip panel on the left, the properties for that slide will show up on the right. You will notice there is an Accessibility button. When you click on it, you can enter a written description for the slide or you can import your slide notes. This text will read the contents to learners who use screen readers who are unable to see the slide. Adobe Captivate is one of the few authoring tools that can create 508 compliant e-learning for users who are visually or hearing impaired. Closed captions is for people who have hearing impairments and will be covered in Section 7. These solutions support government agencies and companies who are committed to improving accessibility for all students. Creating a name for each slide serves several purposes. Students that are using screen readers will hear the name of the slide. Also, if you are using the Table of Contents, the name will automatically import into the Table of Contents. Naming the slide also makes it easier for you as a developer to organize and identify the slide in the film strip. Under the General tab, you can easily select the master slide you want to add to the slide in the film strip by selecting the drop-down. If you want to change the color of the stage for that particular slide, you can by unchecking Use Master Slide Background and Uncheck Project Background, then click inside the color box to pick your color, gradient, or texture. You can also import an image to use in the background. Use the Browse, Delete, and Edit buttons below to make changes to the image. 
I suggest keeping the slide quality at high or optimize because the images you import may not have good quality and an optimized slide will keep the images looking sharp. By default, the time of a new slide is set to 3 seconds. If you want to change it here, you can type it in. Transitions are like effects. A slide transition plays when the learner enters the slide. The Action tab allows you to designate specific actions when the learner enters or leaves the slide. You'll learn more about actions in Section 5. The Audio tab allows you to manage audio from that slide. To save you time, there are certain shared slide properties that you can attach to multiple slides all at once. For instance, you can select all the slides in the film strip on the left by selecting the first slide and then clicking your shift key on your keyboard, scroll all the way to the bottom and click on the last slide. If you only want to select specific slides, you can do this by using your command or control key and selecting the slides independently. In the properties panel on the right, you can change any of the settings under the general tab and there's also some options under the action tab. So when you make the changes, it will apply to all the slides you have selected in your film strip. Let's move on to slide notes. If you created a customized workspace from section 1 to include your slide notes panel, it should be already showing. If it's not showing, go to the main toolbar, select window, and select slide notes. Slide notes can be used as a transcript for your audio, for closed captions, or just for your own notes. Click the plus sign on the right of the panel to add slide notes. You can copy and paste from any document into here. Once the notes are added, you can use them for three purposes. Viewing while recording audio, converting to computerized audio text-to-speech, or creating closed captions. I'll be teaching you how to accomplish these tasks in the audio lesson of Section 6. I hope you've been keeping up with your practical exercises. It's time to open your section exercise document and follow the instructions for the practical skills. In the next lesson, we'll be going over in more detail about managing your slides. In this lesson, we're going to discuss managing your slides, more specifically the right key functions, navigating slides, and grouping slides. So let's jump right in. With a specific thumbnail slide selected in your film strip, the right-click function provides you with many options, as you can see. Also notice that the keyboard shortcuts are provided for you here. If you don't want a slide to show in your published version, but don't want to delete it, hide it. To hide a slide, right-click on the slide and select Hide Slide. To unhide a slide, you can either right-click again, select Show Slide, or you can click the eyeball icon underneath the slide. To ensure that you don't accidentally delete a slide or edit the objects on a slide, lock the slide. Right-click on the slide, select Lock Slide. To unlock, you can either right-click again and select Unlock Slide, or click the icon in the upper right-hand corner of the thumbnail that looks like a lock. You cannot cut slides, but you can delete, copy, paste, or duplicate slides and you can do these functions in three different ways. With the slide selected in the film strip, right-click on the slide and find the options you want. Or, choose your shortcut keys. Another option is to go to the menu bar, select Edit, and choose which function you want from there. I find the easiest way to navigate through the slides is to use the scroll bar and click on the slide that you want to see on the stage. Notice that when you are on the slide in the film strip, there is a black border around it, letting you know that is the slide selected. You can also use the arrows on the application bar at the top to navigate your slides, or type in the slide that you want to go to. To move a slide to a different position in the film strip, click and drag it to the location you want. To expand the film strip to see the slides in columns, take your mouse until you see a double-headed arrow over the right edge of the film strip panel and click and drag it out. Now let's look at grouping slides. To group slides, select all the slides you want to group together by holding your shift key down and selecting the slides, then releasing. Keep in mind you can only select consecutive slides for grouping. Then right-click any of the slides that are selected and select Group Create. Notice the group automatically collapses in the film strip and attaches a color. In the Slide Properties panel, there is a title box to name the group, 
The name of the group shows up in the film strip. And in the properties panel, you also have the option of changing the master slide for all the slides in that group and the color of the group. The color makes the group easier for you to identify as a developer, but doesn't show up in the published product. Grouping slides helps you to manage a large project, and you can move or delete entire groups. Additionally, the group names appear in the table of contents as headings, which is nice for the learners. To expand the group, click on the down arrow in the upper left-hand corner of the group. To collapse it, click on the up arrow in the upper left-hand corner. To ungroup, right-click on any of the slides in the group and select Group Remove. Okay, it's your turn. Open the Section Exercise document and do the practical exercises for Section 2, Lesson 3. In Lesson 4, you'll learn more about adding themes and customizing master slides. In Captivate 6, there's something new called themes that will allow you to choose a look and feel and formatting, giving you a head start in creating your projects. In this lesson, we'll be looking at applying a theme to a project, master slides, and customizing themes and master slides. When you open a new project by going to the main toolbar, select File, New Project, Blank Project, choose the size of your project and click OK. You'll see that the Themes panel shows across the top. The default theme is white. You can scroll through the various themes and see the names on the top of each theme as you scroll over. You can apply any of the themes, and each theme has its unique background, font, formatting, and style, so you don't have to worry about any of these things, which saves you a significant amount of design time. You can also apply themes to an existing project by going to the Documents tab and selecting the project. Let's take a look at the exercise file you've been creating. Now, to see the Themes panel, you must have a slide selected in your film strip and then go to Themes, Show, Hide, Themes Panel, or use the icon in your control panel to show and hide the themes. Once you have applied a theme to your project, you can apply or change any of the different content master slides from the Properties panel to a specific slide. Select the slide in the film strip, then go to the Properties panel on the right, under General Master Slide, select a drop down and select the layout you want. The theme master slides live in the Master Slides panel, typically found at the bottom of the workspace, and from here you can customize the master slides if you want to. You'll notice there is one main master slide and numerous content master slides and question master slides at the bottom. If you modify the main master slide, it will add the content to all of the content master slides. Let's say you want to add a logo to the main master slide. With the main master slide selected, go to the Insert Image in the main toolbar or use the Object Toolbar icon for Image. Navigate to the folder and add the logo. The image will display in the center of the screen, and as you can see, it applies to all the slides. Master slides have their own timeline, so in order to modify the image, making sure I have my main master slide selected, and then go to my Master Slide Timeline and select the image. And I'll hold down my Shift key, click and drag one of the corners to the size I want, and then drag the whole image to one of the corners. To create your own Content Master Slide, select Insert on the main toolbar, then Content Master Slide. You can see it shows up after the Introduction Slide at the bottom. You can name the Content Slide in the Properties panel, and when you're ready, you can add content to the slide. Let's say you decide you don't want the logo on every Content Slide. You can do one of two things. Select the Content Master Slide that you don't want the logo on, and in the Properties panel, unclick Show Main Master Slide Objects. Notice the logo is now removed from the transition slide. Or you can cut the logo from the Main Master Slide and paste it onto your new Content Slide. If you uncheck Use Master Slide Background and uncheck Project Background, you can further customize the Master Slide. Now that you've spent some time making these changes, you may want to save this theme as your own. With any slide selected in the Film Strip panel, go to the Themes in the top main toolbar, select Save Theme As. Navigate to the folder you want to save the theme in, name it. Notice it saves as a .cptm file. 
then click Save. Now, when you show the Themes panel, your theme will be added to it. You can right-click on it to set it as the default theme, and you can click on the tiny drop-down in the upper right-hand corner of the Theme panel to show only your customized themes or browse to download more themes. If you don't already have a branding, applying one of the themes is a great time saver rather than customizing your own formatting fonts and styles. It's time to practice, so open your section exercise document and do the practical exercises for this lesson. The next section deals with how to add content to your slides using standard objects. Captivate provides an array of tools to add content to your slides. In this section, you'll learn how to insert standard objects such as captions, images, smart shapes, animations, zoom, and highlight boxes. In this lesson, I'll be showing you how to work with text captions. Adding text is one way to relay information to your students, such as providing content, instructions on what to do, or feedback on practice activities. One option of inserting text is using the text caption placeholders. To add text to a placeholder, double-click in the text caption, then type the content, or copy and paste the content from another document. Or click on the text caption placeholder icon and type your text or copy and paste it. Notice in the Properties panel on the right, the text style is the default text caption for this specific theme. You can make changes to this if you'd like. And I'll be showing you how to make and save changes in Section 4. Now, take a look at the title caption properties. When I double click and copy or type my title, there are some different properties for the title caption and the subtitle caption. Now, let's say you want to add a text caption on a blank slide. There's no placeholder. Click the Insert Text Caption icon on the Object Toolbar on the left, or go to the Main Toolbar at the top and select Insert Standard Objects Text Caption. Every object you insert onto a slide automatically inserts into the very middle of the slide. Double-click and type your text. Click out of the text caption box when you're ready to move the caption to the place you want it on the slide. Roll your mouse over the text caption and when the mouse pointer turns into a hand, that means you can click and drag the entire box to the location you want it. Now formatting your text caption is done in the Properties panel. Select the text caption on the slide and the properties for that text caption will show up on the right. Change the caption type in the General tab by selecting the drop-down and choosing the caption type you want. You can also change the Callet type in the Callet field by clicking the type of Callet you want. The Character tab allows you to change the font type, style, size, format, color, and highlight. New to Captivate 6 is the option of adding text effects which is a special font formatting option that can be applied to the entire object. Text Effects only works for the entire object, not for specific text selected within the caption. To apply a text effect in the Properties panel, still under the Characters tab, there's a large T button. Click on the Text Effect button and select the effect you want. To create and save your own unique effects, click the button with the large plus sign. The Text Effects dialog box comes up, and on the left side, check the box for the attributes you want to modify. On the right side, make the changes for the properties of that attribute. Click OK to apply the effects to the selected text effect, or click Save to add a new effect to the options on the drop down. If you want to make changes to the individual words in the text caption, Double click in the text caption box and select the word or words you want to make changes to and make the changes in the properties panel. Moving on to the format tab, you can change how the text is aligned by selecting the button you want. Click the decrease or increase to change the indentation. Choose if you want bullets or numbers by selecting the drop down and you have several options here. This is also new to Captivate 6. 
Type or drag your mouse to change the vertical spacing between the lines and type or drag your mouse to change any of the margins. You can also insert symbols by clicking on the symbol icon. I'll be showing you these two other icons, variables, and hyperlinks in section 5, and I'll be discussing the rest of the properties tabs in section 4. So now take some time to practice adding written content to your text captions by using your section exercise document. In the next lesson, you'll be learning more about inserting images. If you've been keeping up with the section exercises, your project should be looking something like this. Looks a little bare, right? Adding images really enriches your e-learning project, and Captivate lets us insert and manipulate various types of images. In this lesson, you'll learn about inserting and editing images. There are several ways to add an image to a slide. Add an image to a placeholder by clicking the image icon. Here you can either insert an image from your project library or click import to navigate to the folder on your computer and select the image and select open. When you do this, you'll notice the image inserts directly into the exact shape of the placeholder. Click the Insert Image icon from the Object Toolbar on the left, or go to the Main Toolbar, select Insert, and then Image. With these options, you'll navigate to the Image folder on your computer, select the image, either double-click it or click Open to insert it onto the slide. Notice with these options, the image inserts into the very center of the slide. You can even open a folder on your computer, select the image, click and drag it, dropping it directly onto the Captivate slide. If your image is already imported and in your project's library, find the image in the library and you can click and drag it right onto the slide. Once the image is on the slide, it is now an object that can be moved, resized, deleted, layered, timed on the timeline, timed with audio, used with effects, and various other options. I'll be talking about common object properties in the next section. In this lesson, we're focusing on unique image editing tools. Probably the easiest way to move an image is to roll your mouse over it until you see a hand and then click and drag it to the location you want. To resize an image, roll your mouse over one of the corners until you see a double-headed arrow and then click and drag. But if you want to maintain aspect ratio, hold your shift key down and click and drag the image to the size you want. You can reset the image to the original size by going to the Properties panel on the right under Image and click the Reset to Original Size button. Staying in the Properties panel under the Image Edit tab, you have certain options here to change the coloring of the image. Move the sliders for each of these tools to see how it affects the image. For example, if you want to make an image more transparent, select the alpha slider and decrease it. You can also check the grayscale box or invert color if you want to make these changes to your image. And you can flip an image by clicking the flip image horizontally or vertically icons. And you can rotate the image left or right by selecting rotate left or rotate right icons. Click the crop icon to bring up the dialog box and from here you can crop by constraining portions or not and you have some other options for editing. Right click an image to provide you with even more options such as deleting, aligning, copying, and pasting. It's time to practice your practical skills by using the section exercise document for this lesson. In the next lesson you'll learn about working with characters and Photoshop files. Captivate 6 comes with images called characters that have a variety of categories and poses. Inserting these characters into your project can provide a more human feel by using them as avatars or presenters in your e-learning course. Be advised that the first time you use the characters, you'll have to download the files, so don't be surprised when you get a pop-up window. Follow the instructions to download. Once you've downloaded the files, to insert a character, make sure you're on the slide that you want the character to go on. Then go to the main toolbar at the top and select Insert. Scroll down to Characters. Select the drop-down. There are four categories. Business, Casual, Illustrated, and Medicine. Each category has some options to choose from, and each category has many poses. 
Use the links at the bottom of the dialog box to browse for additional characters on an external website, either free or paid. Characters are images and have the same image editing properties as regular images. Let's insert this one, click OK, and let's go to the Properties panel under Image Editing and flip the image horizontally. And then I'll go ahead and move her down. Once the character is imported onto your slide, you can now find it in the library by right-clicking and select Find in Library. You can reuse it on any other slide simply by clicking and dragging. Characters are new to Adobe Captivate 6 and offer a wonderful opportunity to add personality to your courses. In Adobe Captivate, you can also insert Photoshop files, bringing each layer in independently, and you can edit the file in Photoshop without leaving Captivate, and update the image in Captivate if you make changes to the source file. To import a Photoshop file, make sure you have the slide selected that you want the Photoshop file to insert on, then go to the main menu, this time go to File, then Import Photoshop. Navigate to your image folder and you'll see that all the other images are grayed out. Only one that's highlighted is the PSD file. Select it and click Open. A pop-up comes up giving you some options such as scaling the images or flattening the image. I'm going to leave this as is because I want my layers to come in as separate files, so I'll just click OK. Notice that both layers are independent of each other. As you can see, this certificate border can be moved around separately from the firefighter helmet. I can also edit them independently. Let's select the firefighter helmet and I'll go to my Properties panel, Image Edit, and make it a bit more transparent. Then I'll center it on the screen. Now, if you want to edit a Photoshop file from Captivate, go to the library and find your PSD folder. You'll see that it has both images in it. You can right-click on either one of the images or the PSD folder and select Edit With. The first time you select this, there won't be the option of Edit With Photoshop. You'll have to navigate to your program files to find Photoshop. And after you've done this once, Edit With PSD Photoshop will be an option in the drop-down. Make the changes in Photoshop you want to make and then click Save. Your changes will update in Captivate. Okay, take a few minutes now to do your practice activities for this lesson. And in the next lesson, we'll focus on inserting Smart Shapes, a brand new feature in Adobe Captivate 6. Using Smart Shapes offers a wider range of versatile shape and text tools. In this lesson, we'll be taking a look at inserting Smart Shapes using the Properties panel and right-click functions. Smart Shapes are an exciting new feature of Adobe Captivate 6 and opens the door to using a multitude of drawing, text, and advanced action options. Look at the Object Toolbar. The very top icon is Smart Shape. Here you'll see a predefined collection of shapes set within groups. The basic group, arrows, buttons, banners, and math symbols. Let's select a basic shape, rounded rectangle. Then drag your mouse to create the size of the shape you want on your slide. You can adjust the curve of the smart shape by scrolling your mouse near the yellow box until the mouse turns black and then click and drag the box to the desired spot. Each smart shape is a little bit different. For instance, now I'll select a banner which may have two or three yellow squares to manipulate. One smart shape that is very different is the polygon drawing tool. Instead of clicking and dragging this one, you click your mouse to create each point, and then when the points come together, it creates a shape. To write in a smart shape, double click inside it and start typing. The font that applies is set for the particular theme, so if you want to change the font or style, highlight the font and go to the Properties panel under Character. In the Properties panel, you'll see that the Captivate assigns a name to the smart shape at the top. Naming convention becomes important, and you'll understand why when we discuss actions and interactions in Section 6. For now, start the names of your objects with a capital A, because the drop-downs for advanced actions are alphabetized. Then add a slide number, then add a unique identifier for the specific object. The Smart Shape Fill and Stroke are preset to insert according to the theme you are using. You can change the look and feel by selecting the Stroke option and picking a color you want. Change the fill or the percent of the fill, the width of the stroke, and the style of the stroke. 
If you decide you don't like what you've done and you want to revert back to the theme colors, go to the icon underneath style and select reset style icon. Let's say I've made my changes to the smart shape and I want more exactly like the one on the slide. I can right click and copy and paste or I can select duplicate. Duplicate's one less click than copy and paste, so I'll select that. I'll do that for each of my smart shapes, typing in what I want and moving them and renaming them. I can also convert my smart shapes to freeform by right clicking and selecting freeform points. Then I can click and drag these points. When I'm done, I just click outside of the smart shape. If you don't like what you've done, here's a tip. You can always use Command or Control Z to undo. If you decide you don't like the smart shape, but you have it in the exact location you want and don't want to insert a new smart shape, you can right click and select Replace Smart Shape at the bottom. There are other options you can do by right clicking, some of which we'll be addressing in future lessons, but notice that you can arrange forward or backward and align center horizontally or vertically. You can also add effects and audio to smart shapes. Now it's your turn to work on these skills using your section exercise document. In the next lesson, you'll be learning about animations. To make e-learning interesting and fun, add some animations. Captivate comes with some existing Swift files. In this lesson, you'll learn how to add Swift animations and text animations. To insert an animation, go to Insert Animation or click the Animation icon in your Object Toolbar. If you can't see it, double click on the dark gray bar at the top of the toolbar to expand your toolbar. Here you'll see that there are various kinds of bullets, highlights, arrows, and other, such as right and wrong marks. As with all objects, it'll insert into the center of your slide and there's a tiny green circle in the upper right hand corner letting you know it's synced with the source. The only way to view the animation is to preview, so I'll go to my preview icon on the control panel and select preview next five slides. With the animation selected, you'll see in the properties panel there's a tiny information icon to the right of the object name. This provides you with the details of the animation. You also have the option here of editing it or swapping it out for another animation. Reduce the alpha percent if you want the animation to become more transparent. Under timing, you can choose a specific time or one of the other options in the dropdown. You can also choose to synchronize with your project. This synchronizes your animation with the project's timeline speed. If your animation is not playing smoothly, this is a good option to pick. If you have the option of looping, the animation will restart from the beginning every time it comes to the end. After you've inserted an animation, you'll also find the animation in the library and can reuse it simply by clicking it from within the library and dragging it onto another slide. Built into Captivate are text animations. Click Insert Text Animation or click the Text Animation icon in your object toolbar. Enter your text in the box and format the text however you like. Click the loop box if you want the animation to play over and over until the user either clicks next or reaches the end of the timeline. Then click OK. In the properties panel under the general tab, select the effect drop down and you'll see an array of options. If you pick one, you'll see the preview of the effect in the properties top window. If your text is too long, select the Properties panel to bring up the Text Animations Properties box and take your mouse and click between the words you want to separate. Then select Enter on your keyboard. That's better. OK, it's time for you to practice your skills by following the section exercise document instructions. Then come back and join me for the next lesson to learn more about objects that draw the learner's attention to an, a specific area. In this lesson, you'll learn about objects that draw attention to a specific area. We'll be discussing highlight boxes, zoom areas, and mouse movements. Highlight box is another way to add a shape to your slide. It's typically used to draw attention to an area or an object on your slide with visual emphasis. To add a highlight box, go to the main toolbar and select Insert Standard Object Highlight Box, or click on the Highlight Box icon in the Object Toolbar. 
Let's move the box over this part of the image and resize it by clicking and dragging one of the corners. To format the highlight box, go to the Properties panel, select the Fill color, the Percent to Fill, the Stroke color, and the stroke width you like. By default, the inside of the box is filled, so it looks like this. One advantage of a highlight box is that you can select in the Properties panel, Fill Outer Area. And when I use this option, I like to change the percent to 70%. You can't see the difference this makes in edit mode, but when I preview the slide, you can see that the outer area is now grayed out, and so the learner's eye is drawn to the image. Add zoom areas to emphasize a specific area by magnifying or shrinking the object. To insert a zoom area in the main toolbar, select Insert Standard Object Zoom Area, or select the Zoom Area icon on the Object toolbar. Move and resize the zoom destination to the place you want the zoom area to go to. Move and resize the zoom source box over the area you want to magnify or shrink. In the Properties panel, under the Timing tab, you can control when the zoom area appears, and you can control how fast the zoom area zooms in or out. Another object that can be inserted into your slide to draw the learner's attention to an area is a mouse movement. To insert a mouse, go to the main toolbar, insert standard object mouse, or click the mouse icon on the object toolbar. The mouse will insert from the left-hand corner to the center of the screen. You can move either end of the mouse by selecting and dragging it to the location you want. In the Properties panel, you can change how the mouse looks by selecting one of the options, and you have other options here like making the mouse double-sized or straightening the path. You can also customize the mouse click by adding a color animation. If you insert a mouse onto the next slide, you'll notice that the starting point of the curved blue line has changed, and now corresponds to the location you chose on the previous slide. There are some right-click options. Notice there's no delete option with the right-click. To delete a mouse, click the delete key on your keyboard, or go to the main toolbar, select edit, and delete. Now that you've learned about inserting standard objects and the unique properties associated with these objects, it's time for you to practice your skills. In the next section, you'll be learning about the common properties in managing these objects and assets. In the last section, you discovered that standard objects have unique properties. This section focuses on common object properties. An asset is any external object that's inserted into your project's library, such as images, videos, animations, and audio. So this section will teach you how to manage these assets using the timeline, library, object styles, and effects. In this first lesson, you'll learn about the properties, fill and stroke, shadow and reflection, transition, and transform tabs. Okay, so I'm going to insert a smart shape from the object toolbar on the left, and you'll notice the properties panel for that smart shape automatically appears on the right. Under the fill and stroke tab, I'll click on the fill color box. Notice there are three icons at the top. The left one is the solid color. From here, I can select any of the regular colors or Click on the color picker and drag the slider to change the color, or if I know the exact color numbers, I can enter the numbers here or type in the six digit hexadecimal value. Another option is to choose the color you want by selecting the pick color in the upper right hand corner to copy a color. For instance, maybe I want the exact red color of the firefighter helmet. I can click on it, and then if I make my opacity to 100%, I can see that they're now the exact same color. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my stroke, selecting the blue from the firefighter helmet, and change the width so you can see it. You can even change the style of the stroke if you want. Now, let's say I want to make this fill a gradient. I'll click on the fill color again and select the middle icon at the top of the palette. There are some preset gradients that I can choose and even select the direction I want by clicking on these swatches. When I click on the existing color stop on the bottom of the bar, I can drag it to change where I want the color to start and stop. But let's say I want to customize my gradient to the exact red color of the fire helmet. Click on the color stop to bring up the color palette and select the color using the eyedropper. Then add more stops by clicking on the gradient bar again. Click on these button icons 
and slide them off if you need to. Click on these bottom icons for a linear or radial gradient or if you want to reverse the colors. Once I'm satisfied, I can save this by selecting Add this custom gradient to my custom gradient bar and now it'll be available for other projects as well. There's one more icon in the palette, the texture option. Click on the icon on the top row to see the preset textures or add a custom image by clicking the browse folder and choose an image in your library or import it from your computer. If the image is smaller than the shape, you may need to select Tile to fill the shape, and you can choose to stretch the image or not. In this case, since the image is larger than the box, I'll deselect Tile, but select Stretch. Under the Shadow and Reflection tab, I can add a shadow and or reflection to such objects as smart shapes, captions, and images. You have the option of choosing either outer or inner shadow, and you can choose which angle of lighting you want. To customize the shadow, select the arrow under the custom and choose your color. Change the opacity by changing the percent and enter a number to indicate how sharp or blurry the edges of the shadow are. Type in the distance to determine how far away from the object you want the shadow. If you can't see all of the components of your property inspector, you can always use your scroll bar on the right side of it to scroll up or down. To add a reflection, click the reflection box and decide the type of reflection you want. The settings in the transition tab determine if you want the object to fade in or out or just appear. Select the drop down to see and apply the options. When images are coming in or leaving your slide, it's a nice design practice to fade in and out, making the image appear and disappear smoothly. The Transform tab lets you move, resize, and rotate the object. The X and Y axis is the position on your slide, the W and H is the size of your object, and the angle is the way the object is rotated. You can also use your mouse by clicking and dragging the object on the slide to the location you want it. You can click and change the angle manually by selecting the rotation handle at the top or you can resize the object by clicking and dragging the resize handles. Remember, if you want to constrain proportions of the shape, make sure you click your Shift key on your keyboard while you click and drag. I use the Transform X and Y axis. If I have objects on different slides, that I want them all to be in the exact same location. You'll learn more about managing objects in the next lesson. For now, take a few minutes to practice using the Fill and Stroke, Shadow and Reflection, and Transition and Transform tabs in the Properties panel. To manage objects the way you want, Captivate provides an array of options. In this lesson, you'll learn how to align, arrange, and group objects. Aligning objects accurately on your slide helps make your projects look more professional. In the previous lesson, you learned about the Transform tab in the Properties panel, looking at the numerical location of the X and Y axis of the object. However, there's a faster way to align multiple objects on the same slide. First, ensure you have the Align toolbar showing. If it's not, go to Window Align and it'll appear underneath the Control Panel. Select all the objects you want to align one at a time by holding your Shift key down and clicking on each object, or click and drag your mouse over all the objects. The first one you select has white boxes around it, the others black. The white boxed object is the one the rest will follow. Go to the Align toolbar and select the buttons you want, such as Resize to Same Size, Distribute Horizontally, Align Middle, or just select the icon on the far right, Align and Resize to Same Size. And now all my objects are in the same place and I can manually move all three images to the desired location. When you have overlapping objects like this on a slide, you may want to make sure they are layered in the correct order or maybe you want to edit an object underneath. In the next lesson, I'll be discussing how to use your timeline for stacking, but for now, either use the icons in the control panel to arrange your objects forward, backward, front, or behind, or right-click to find the same options. Right-clicking on an object also provides you with various other options, most of which have keyboard shortcuts and all of which assist in managing your object in various ways.
Grouping objects is a fantastic new feature of Adobe Captivate 6 and makes managing your objects much easier. To create a group, select all the objects you want, right click and select Group. Once you've created a group, I recommend naming it in the Properties panel so that it's easy to identify on the timeline. Grouped objects can be moved, resized, and certain properties can be applied to all objects in the group from the Properties panel or by right clicking. Additionally, you can use the entire group as part of an action or advanced action. A little beyond the scope of this course, though. To remove one object from the entire group, click the group, then select the object you want to remove, right-click on it, and select Remove from Group. To ungroup all the objects in the group, right-click on any of the objects in the group and select Ungroup. It's time for you to practice managing your objects using the Align, Arrange, and Grouping proficiencies. Use your exercise section document to complete the skills in the storyboard. The next lesson covers how to use the timeline to manage your objects. Captivate projects play like a movie along a timeline. In this lesson, you'll learn about how to set the timing of objects and manage objects using the timeline. Notice that when I have an object selected on my slide, it's also highlighted on the timeline. When you name an object in the Properties panel, the name appears on the timeline, making it easy to identify. If you can't see the names, take your mouse over the edge of the vertical line between the timeline and the name bar until your mouse turns into a double-headed arrow, then click and drag it out. If you can't see all the objects on your timeline, take your mouse over the horizontal line between the stage and the timeline until your mouse turns into a double-headed arrow and click and drag it up. If you can't see your entire timeline, use the scroll bar at the bottom or select the zoom slider to zoom in or out. The timeline is used to change when objects appear and or disappear from your slide. You can drag the edge of an object within the timeline to where you want it. Roll your mouse over one end until it turns into a double-headed arrow, then click and drag the end. I can also drag the entire object by rolling my mouse over the object until I see my mouse turn into a hand, then click and drag the entire object to the time I want it to enter and leave the slide. If you look in the Properties panel under the Timing tab, you'll notice the numbers correspond. And if you want to get more specific, you can change these numbers here too. It's a good idea to sync objects entering and leaving the timeline with specific information or audio that you want the learner to focus on. To select multiple objects in the timeline, select one object and then select the Shift key on your keyboard and click the last object on the timeline. If you only want specific objects not in sequential order, use your Command Control key. With the object selected, you can use any of the right click functions. And here you can also create a group. Remember grouping objects from the last lesson? This is just another way to accomplish that. Notice on the timeline now that you get an arrow to contract or expand the group, making the timeline more manageable. The timeline also functions as a stacking order, so the objects at the bottom of the timeline are underneath the objects above. I can change the order of my objects from the timeline by clicking an object and dragging it above another object. To make developing easier, Captivate allows you to either lock or hide objects on your slide. For example, maybe I want to lock an object because I've spent a lot of time placing it in the exact location I want and don't want to accidentally select it. I can lock it by selecting the lock next to the image on the timeline. Now I can move the other objects, but not this one. Let's say I've layered, positioned, and timed all my objects perfectly on the slide, but now I want to see the image below without changing the top image. I can select the eye next to the image on the timeline and hide it. If you hide objects on your slide, it doesn't hide from your viewers or even from you in the preview mode. It only hides in the edit mode to make it easier for you to manage your objects. A common mistake for beginners is that an object doesn't appear because the object's timing is set for 3 seconds but the timeline has been extended. One of my favorite shortcuts is Command or Control E which sets the object to appear for the rest of the timeline and you can do this shortcut for multiple objects too. To make objects easier to identify, Captivate color codes them in the timeline. Standard objects are blue while interactive objects are green. When an object is selected, it turns dark blue. 
Additionally, the objects have icons attached to them on the timeline, so you can identify the various specific types of objects. Now it's time to use your section exercise document and storyboard to practice timing the objects in your project. In the next lesson, you'll learn how to use the library as an asset resource tool. The library stores a list of all the assets imported into the current project, including audio, backgrounds, images, media, and presentations. In this lesson, you'll learn about managing your assets using the library. The default location of the library panel is to the right of the properties panel. If it's not showing, go to the Window menu and select Library. Assets you insert into your project are automatically placed in the main area of the Library panel into these preset folders organized by type. Expand and contract these folders to see the details of each asset. Even if you delete an asset from a slide, it's stored in the library with a zero, indicating it's unused. Select an item in the library to preview it in the top pane. Just below the preview, there's a row of icons that provides various functions. Additionally, right-clicking on the item provides many of these same options. We're going to go through them now. To delete an asset from the library, either right-click on it and select Delete, or click the Delete icon. To delete all unused assets, click the Select Unused icon and then click the Delete icon. To update an asset, click the Update icon or right-click and select Update. If you've made changes to the source file, it will update it. To find out which slides the assets are used on, select the Usage icon or right-click and select Usage. This shows you exactly which slides the items are used on. To open the Properties panel of an asset, select the Properties icon or double-click on the asset. From here, you can see where your source file is located, along with the specific properties of the file, and you can update, import, edit, or find out the usage. To edit an asset, select the Edit icon or right-click and select Edit With. Then you'll navigate to the software you want to edit with, such as Photoshop. To export or import an asset, select the Export or Import icons or right-click and navigate to the folder you want to export or import the asset to or from. To import an asset from another library, click the Open Library icon Find and select the Captivate project with the library you want. Click the Open button. In the pop-up window, find and select the asset you want to import. Then drag the asset to the slide or folder in the library. If you click the Open Library icon again, you'll notice that previously open libraries are now showing, so you can easily access other previously open libraries. To rename an asset, select the asset, then right-click and select Rename. To reuse an asset, Click and drag it to the slide you want. Reused assets do not add additional bandwidth into your project. As you can see, this image is used 10 times but maintains the size of only one image. Practice importing assets from another library into your Captivate project by following the instructions in the exercise section document. In the next lesson, you'll be learning more about managing your assets by creating styles and effects. A style enables you to save the formatting settings of an object and apply them to other objects for consistency. Object effects allow you to create visual significance as objects move on the slide. In this lesson, you'll learn how to modify and apply styles and how to add and save effects. Captivate comes with various styles associated with specific themes, but you may want to modify or create your own custom style. For example, I'll select this text caption on slide 1 and in the Properties panel under Character, I'll make some changes, such as change the font family, size, format, and color. Now go to the top of the Properties panel and notice there's a plus sign next to the default caption style. That means changes have been made to that style. I want to create a new style, so I'll select this first icon on the left. I'll name it Instructions and click OK. Now I can apply this style to other text captions. On the film strip, I'll scroll down to slide 4, select both text captions, and then on the Properties panel, select the drop-down next to Style and select Instructions. 
Notice on the slide both text captions change. If I decide to make further changes to this style, but I want to keep it the same name and apply the changes to all the other captions associated with it, I'll make the formatting changes, then select the Save icon under Style, and you'll see the changes have been applied to all text captions of my new style on this slide and on slide 1. Although beyond the scope of this course, you should know that you can further manage your styles by going to the main menu, Edit, Object Style Manager, and from here you can even export and import save styles. Object Effects let you create visual interest using movement similar to animations. Effects are managed in the Effects panel. If it's not showing, go to the window Effects to add it to the Timeline group at the bottom, or change your workspace switcher in the top right hand corner to the Effects view. Effects can be triggered by the timeline or an action. To add a time based effect, select the object you want and in the Effects panel select Add Effect. And you'll notice that I have many to choose from. I'll select Entrance, Ease In, from right. You'll notice on the image there's now a tiny box with the number in the bottom right hand corner. I can click on it to see the motion path, which I can also adjust manually if I like. I can add multiple effects to the same object, change the speed of the effect by changing the time on the timeline, and I can sync it with my slide playhead, and I can live preview. If you spend the time customizing effects, you may want to save it to reuse it later. Click the Save icon at the bottom, browse to the folder you want to save it in, and name it. You can also delete effects by selecting the effect and clicking the Delete icon at the bottom. It's time for you to practice creating new styles and effects. E-learning should be interactive, and in the next section, you'll learn how to add actions and interactions to your project. Now that we've covered the basics, let's explore some of the things that make Captivate a really powerful tool. Don't worry if you don't get all the content the first time. You can always pause the video, rewind it, or watch it as often as you like. And if you get stuck, you can always get help by going to the Adobe Captivate 6 online help resource file. Go to the main menu toolbar, select Help, Adobe Captivate Help. Using interactions, quizzes, scenarios, and games can transform the student's experience from verbal and visual learning to actually doing something, providing specific results. In this section, you'll learn about pre-made interactive objects, how to build your own interactions, and how to create quiz questions. These become your building blocks for more advanced actions. In this lesson, you'll learn about inserting rollover captions, images, smart shapes, and slidelets. Rollover objects are originally hidden and show only when the user rolls their mouse over a specific area on the slide. To insert a rollover caption, go to the main toolbar and select Insert, Standard Object, Rollover Caption, or click the Insert Rollover Caption icon on the Object toolbar. Move the rollover area to the place on the slide serving as a hotspot. In the Properties panel, format the object, name it, I'll make it transparent and with no stroke width. Enter the text in the text caption, format it in the Properties panel, and place it where you want. Now, when we preview it, the text caption only shows up when the learner rolls their mouse over the area. To insert a rollover image, let's select the rollover image icon on the object toolbar. Browse and select the image you want by double-clicking it or click Open. On the timeline, I'll hide my rollover text captions so I can then move my rollover area over the text that says Roll Mouse Here to find out. In the Properties panel, I'll name it and make it transparent. Size the image and position it to where you want. Now let's preview. The learner must roll their mouse over the text in order to see the image. To insert a smart shape, insert the smart shape you want, format it, and position it to how you want it to appear. Then right click on the smart shape and select Convert to Rollover Smart Shape. Move, format, and resize the rollover area. And now let's preview. 
A slidelet is like a slide within a slide. To insert a rollover slidelet, click the rollover slidelet icon on the object toolbar. Move, resize, and format in the Properties panel how you want the rollover area to serve like the hotspot. Move and resize the slidelet frame to the size and position you want. Add non-interactive objects to the slidelet as you would the regular slide. The slidelet has its own timeline, and as I add objects to the slidelet, you can see them on the timeline, and I can change when they appear or disappear. To return to the regular slide timeline, deselect the slidelet, and vice versa. Then Preview. Notice that when I roll my mouse over the image, the slidelet appears. Practice inserting rollover objects by using your section exercise document and storyboard. In the next lesson, you'll learn about inserting smart interactions and widgets. Widgets are configured Flash-based objects that are pre-built so you don't have to use Flash. Smart learning interactions are widget templates that are brand new to Captivate 6. Widgets can augment the capabilities of Captivate by allowing you to easily insert interactivity with quality content. Although Smart Interactions are a type of widget, the main difference is that Smart Interactions are compatible with HTML5 output, which is not the case with most other widgets. To insert a Smart Learning Interaction, select the icon on the Object Toolbar. Roll your mouse over each one for a brief review, and then select the one you want. Click Insert. Choose from one of the various themes which color format you want, and you can even customize your own buttons, content, and header if you like. Double-click on each object to add your content. Here's a tip. You can copy and paste content into the content area. Click the plus sign of the audio or image icons to add media if these options are available. Click the large plus sign at the bottom to add more accordions. And if you decide you don't want an accordion, click on it and select the minus sign to delete it. Then click OK. The Properties panel of the widget is the same as other animations. Notice in the Timing tab and on the timeline at the bottom, the display is set for a specific time of 3 seconds. You'll probably want to change this to Rest of Slide. To make changes to the widget after you've inserted it, either double-click on it or click the Widget Properties button in the Properties panel. Besides interactions, there are three other types of widgets, Static, Interactive, and Question Widgets. The widgets that come with Captivate are located in the Gallery folder. The first time you select Insert Widget, you'll automatically be taken to this folder. But if you ever insert a widget from another location, the next time you try to insert a widget, you'll be taken to the last folder you visited. So you need to know how to navigate back to the Captivate Gallery. For Mac users, go to Application Adobe Captivate 6 Gallery Widgets. For PC users, go to C Drive. Program Files, Adobe, Adobe Captivate 6, Gallery, and Widgets. Select one of the widgets and double-click on it or select Open. Configure the widget properties. Every widget has different properties, but once you've configured the properties you like, click OK. Then preview your slide. Widgets provide an array of interactive objects, and there are many free and paid-for widgets online. But practice with a few easy ones first, using your section exercise document and storyboard. In the next lesson, we'll get started with the types of actions. Actions have the ability to stop the slide until the student does something. This introduces another level of complexity as the learner can receive feedback depending on what action they choose. Interactive objects are buttons, click boxes, and text entry boxes, and are found come together on the object toolbar. To insert a button, select the button icon. You'll learn about all the other tabs in the Properties panel in the next lesson. In this lesson, we're focusing on the types of actions in the Action pane. Continue means that when the student clicks the button, the slide will continue until the end of the timeline, and then automatically goes to the next slide. Go to Previous or Next Slide. We'll move the slide forward or backward when the student clicks. Go to Last Visited Slide means that the student will be taken to the last slide they were on prior to the current slide. 
Jump to a slide means that the student will be taken to whatever slide you designate when they click the button. Return to quiz is a new action associated with quizzing. Open URL or file will take the student to a web browser or PDF stored on the internet. Add the URL link and then select the drop down. Typically, you'll choose new, meaning the link will open in a new window. To assign Open Another Project, click the drop down or browse to another file such as the Captivate file, Flash Output file, or Video Composition file. If you assign Send Email to a button, when the user clicks on it, they'll be sent to an email address. Type in the email address here and then click on the drop down. If you deselect Continue Playing Project, the project will pause when the email message pops up. Execute JavaScript allows you to extend what Captivate can do using code. To enter code, click the Script Window button, enter the code, and click OK. Then click the drop down to select your choices. Execute Advanced Action allows you to perform more than one action at one time or in sequential order using standard advanced actions. Conditional advanced actions perform an action if something is true, then something else happens. These are customized actions that you can build and then assign to a button. Play Audio plays an audio file that is not on the timeline, and Stop Triggered Audio stops the audio that is playing from the Play Audio action. Show Action means when the student clicks the button, a hidden object will appear, and Hide means that when they click, a visible object will disappear. Enable allows you to activate an interactive object such as another button or click box that was previously disabled. Disable will deactivate an interactive object. Assign is used to change the value of a variable to an exact value such as a number or text. Increment is used to add a user-defined variable that has a number value such as adding points to a score. Decrement subtracts from a user-defined variable that has a number value, such as subtracting points from a score. You can also apply an effect to an object so that when the student clicks the button, the effect will occur. Or select no action, which does nothing on purpose. Okay, now that you know what the actions do, let's have some fun in the next lesson adding actions to interactive objects. Now that you know what the various types of actions can do, add them to your projects using interactive objects. In this lesson, you'll learn how to add an action to a slide, to text, and to a button. Understand that adding actions is a more advanced Captivate feature, and this course hits the tip of the iceberg as far as what actions can do. If you want more information on advanced actions, there are many fantastic resources on the Adobe Captivate blog. Go to the Help menu and select Adobe Captivate blog. Actions can be triggered when a student enters a slide or exits a slide. To add an action to a slide, select the slide in the film strip, and in the Properties panel, go to the Action tab. Select the drop-down next to On Enter or On Exit. For example, you may want to navigate the student to a different slide when they reach the end of the timeline without the student clicking anything. To insert a hyperlink to text, select the text in the caption or the smart shape. Then in the Properties panel, under the Format tab, select the hyperlink icon. Select the action from the drop-down list and configure the rest of the action. Then click OK. Notice that once you set the action, the text automatically is blue and underlined, and when they roll their mouse over it, a hand will show up letting the student know that it's an active link. Buttons and click boxes have very similar properties. However, buttons have a few additional features. To insert a button, select the icon on the object toolbar. Notice that it appears on the timeline. Let's right click and select Show for Rest of Slide. In the Properties panel, under the General tab, you can select the button type. This button is the default for the specific theme, but if you want to customize it, a transparent button allows you to change the fill and stroke properties. A text button removes the option of fill and stroke, but still allows you to customize how the text looks. With transparent or text buttons, you can type what you want the button to indicate in the caption and change the characters. An image button provides a link to browse to select your own image button. 
Some are provided in the window, but most are in the gallery folder. Click the folder icon to view a multitude of customized image buttons provided by Adobe. Button widgets offer additional button formats and effects that come in interactive or static options. Let's move on to the Action tab of a button. On Success, select the action that occurs when the student clicks the button, and decide if you want the student to have infinite or finite attempts, and if you desire, provide a keyboard shortcut for that button. Under the Options tab, decide if you want to include captions. A hint caption will provide a pop-up caption when the student rolls their mouse over the button. Provide a success or failure caption if you want a caption to show when the student either clicks on the button or clicks somewhere else on the slide. If you include a success or failure caption, you'll need to decide if you want the slide to pause long enough to read them. Use the hand cursor if you want a hand to show when the student rolls their mouse over the button and choose if you want the student to double click on the button or disable the click sound of the button. Under the Timing tab, decide when you want the button to appear and when you want the button to pause on the slide. Notice on the timeline, a vertical line appears on the button. That's where the pause is. Be aware that if you have objects entering the slide after the pause, the objects will not show until the student clicks the button. And if you have the action of the button set for go to next slide, the student will not see the objects appear. You can click and drag the pause to the area that you want from the timeline. Now that you can add interaction to your projects, go and practice using your section exercise document. In the next lesson, you'll learn about text entry boxes and quiz features. All right, let's talk about more interactions you can add to your courses. In this lesson, you'll learn about text entry boxes and quizzing features. Students enter text into your course using a text entry box. This text can be graded, scored, sent to a learning management system, and used along with variables to store and be displayed back to the student at a later time in the course. To add a text entry box, select the icon on the object toolbar. As you can see, the default is a blank box. In the Properties panel, under the General tab, you can add text into the box as a hint. This text will be overridden when the student enters his or her own text. Retain the text means that the text will remain in the text box even after the student leaves a slide. Show Text Box Frame provides an outline around the box. If you're using the box as a password, the letters the student enters will show as asterisks if you select this box. If you want the text entry box graded, select Validate User Input. A variable is stored data. Text entry boxes are assigned a variable so that you can use whatever the student writes in the text box later in the course if needed. You can even define your own variables by selecting the X folder on the right. Variables are a more advanced Captivate feature, so when you're ready to learn more about variables and advanced actions, Go to the Help in the main toolbar and select Adobe Captivate Help. Then click on Variables and Advanced Actions. If you're more interested in webinars and video tutorials, go to the Adobe Captivate blog. On Focus Lost means that you can choose an action to occur if the student clicks off the text entry box. By default, the Submit button is added with the text entry box. This is used to validate the student's input. If you're not using the box for validation, under the Options tab, you can deselect Show Button. If you're using the button in the Action tab, decide what action will execute when the student clicks it. You can also select the Submit button and make changes to it in the Properties panel. Back in Section 2, you added a quiz question to your project. If you recall, to add a quiz question, go to the main toolbar, Quiz, Question Slide. Now we're going to take a look at the properties of the quiz question. This course covers just the basic features. With the slide selected, select the text caption and type or paste your question here. Then select each answer caption and type or paste your answers. Select the correct answer by clicking on it. The properties for that one question appear in the Quiz Properties panel over on the right. The options here are based on the type of question. Decide if you want a graded or survey question. You can add more answers, change the points, and select some of the various other options. 
Under the Action tab, choose your options if the student answers correctly or incorrectly. You can change the text on the Success, Failure, and Hint captions by selecting each one, double-clicking, and typing your response. You can also change the properties of the specific captions in the Properties panel. Adobe Captivate 6 has some new advanced quizzing features such as pretest questions, branching, and partial and negative scoring. These features make quizzing much more functional and engaging, but are beyond the scope of this course. Be on the lookout for an advanced Captivate course. In the meantime, you can find tutorials on the Adobe Captivate blog. To find the quiz preferences, go to the main toolbar and select Quiz Preferences. Under Reporting, select Enable Reporting for this project if you are uploading to a learning management system. Under Settings, decide if you want to make the quiz optional or mandatory. Under Pass or Fail, choose a passing grade percent or points. And what will happen if the student passes or fails the entire quiz? By adding interactions, you're creating custom functionality for students not only making the content interesting and memorable, but reinforcing the information and assessing learning. Take some time now to practice using your exercise section document. In the next section, you'll be learning how to create software training simulations and video demonstrations. One of the awesome unique features of Captivate is that you can record your own videos. Software Simulations lets you record what you're doing on your computer just by clicking your mouse or keyboard. Captivate 6 also provides high definition video demonstration, which is full motion recording for all your actions. In this section, you'll learn how to create, edit, and publish a software simulation and a high definition video. What you're seeing right now is a demonstration using Adobe Captivate's HD video option, and you'll be creating something similar as part of your practical skills later. In previous lessons, I mentioned that students learn by seeing, hearing, and doing the tell me, show me, and let me do it model. Adobe Captivate is a one-stop shop software product that allows you to create all these types of e-learning projects in one application. In the first five sections of this series, you learned how to create a Captivate project from a PowerPoint and how to build a project from scratch. Now you're going to learn how to create a demonstration, such as the student can sit back and watch what's happening on the screen, and you'll learn how to create an interactive training simulation so that the student can apply what they've learned by participating in the steps. This first lesson covers preparing and recording a software simulation. The typical software simulation is a series of movements captured by your mouse clicks or keyboard into a series of slides. When published, it plays like a movie. Before you create a simulation, however, you should plan what you're going to record by creating a storyboard, writing your narration, and walking through every step. Before you record, it's always a good idea to practice walking through the steps several times to cut down on editing time post-production. To record a software simulation with Captivate open, choose File in the main toolbar and Record New Software Simulation. From the pop-up under the Size section, choose Application. Select the drop-down and choose the application you've already opened and are ready to start recording. You can choose the Snap to the Application window or region, or you can customize the size of your application. Best practice is to try to record your application at the same size that your computer resolution is and your Captivate project will be. You can choose Snap to Custom Size and then drag the red border to where you want it or select the drop-down to select a particular size or type in the size. The quality of your project is affected by the size you choose, but the size you choose depends on a variety of variables. If you're not sure what size to choose, a good rule of thumb is to record a higher resolution because quality is less affected by resizing to a smaller project versus resizing to a larger project. Under the Recording section, Automatic means Captivate will record the captures based on your mouse clicks and keyboard strokes. 
Manual means that the captures are performed only if you select Print Screen on your keyboard if you're a PC user. The Mac alternative to Print Screen can be set up in the Settings. Click the button. Under Preferences, Recording, Settings, Keys, you can change the keyboard shortcuts here. You'll learn more about the recording preferences in the next lesson. You can still use the manual print screen even in the automatic mode, so that's typically what you're going to select. A demo means that the student will be watching what you do on the screen, a demonstration. An assessment is used to test the student's knowledge and scores every step. Training helps the student practice the procedures and provides feedback without scoring. Custom allows you to customize recording settings. If you choose more than one of these options, Captivate will create separate files for each one. Panning is automatically turned off. Panning moves to a specific area of your screen. So if you have a wide horizontal document, you may want to add automatic or manual panning. But keep in mind, panning creates a larger file because it creates a full motion recording effect. So the best practice is to avoid panning if possible. If you want to record narration while you record, select the type of microphone you're using. You might find that the recording narration while you record is easy, but for most people, it's like rubbing your head and your belly in opposite directions. So a good rule of thumb is to record the narration separately. Once you're all set up, click Record. You'll get a 3, 2, 1 countdown. And then Captivate records every mouse click and or keyboard clicks that you type. When you're ready to end the recording, select End on your keyboard or whatever you've chosen on your keyboard shortcuts. Recording training simulations is a great way to involve your students in practical applications. But let me emphasize that recording good simulations takes time and practice. I recommend you spend some time viewing good training simulations to see what works and get ideas, and then practice, practice, practice. You can always go to the Adobe Captivate help file for instructions and the blog for tutorials and examples. In the next lesson, you'll be learning more about the recording preferences. Now that you know how to record a simulation, you should also know how to change the preferences. This lesson will review each category in the recording preferences. When you select File, Record New Software Simulation, you should get in the habit of checking the settings by clicking the button, which brings up the Preferences dialog box for this specific recording. You can also open the Preferences dialog box from within Captivate. If you're on a PC, go to Edit Preferences. If you're on a Mac, go to Adobe Captivate Preferences. To change the settings for all future projects, open the Preferences dialog box from within the Welcome window without a project open. In the Settings category on the left, choose which language you want the captions to be in. Select the audio settings if you are recording narration into a microphone while recording your simulation. If you deselect narration, you can choose if you want your slide length to be based on the amount of time it takes you to perform each step. The camera sounds is a physical sound that lets you know that each click is being recorded. The sounds are not included in the published version. If you want each keystroke to be captured, keep this checked. Uncheck it if you just want the entire typed message to appear all at once. If you don't want to see the red recording frame, you can hide it. If you're recording full screen, you may want to hide your docked icons. If another window pops up during recording, it will be moved inside the recording area if you have this checked. If you use drag and drop or mouse wheel actions, the full motion recording is triggered and will capture these movements. In the video demo category on the left, if you don't want the mouse recorded, uncheck Show Mouse in Video Demo Mode. The working folder stores the temporary files after you save your files so that it opens faster the next time. If you want to change this location, select Browse. With full motion recording, you can select the video color mode. 16-bit creates a smaller size file. The quality is not as good. 
32-bit gives you more color and although the file size is a little larger, I recommend you leave this as the default. In the Keys category, you can change the keyboard shortcuts by clicking in the field and selecting the shortcuts you want on your keyboard. To configure the settings for each automatic recording, select the Modes category on the left. You can change the mode by selecting the drop-down. Each mode will have different options to choose from. In the Demonstration mode, if you choose to add text captions, Captivate will automatically add captions based on your mouse click. If your software has small captions that provide the name of the tool when the student rolls their mouse over it, called tooltips, Captivate will create these captions for you. You can choose to use Smart Shapes instead of Text Captions if you want, and then choose the style of the Smart Shape you want. If you select Mouse Location and Movement, Captivate will include the movement of the mouse from one click to the next, and highlight boxes are added around the item that you click, providing a visual clue. Assessment and Training modes provide additional options of adding click boxes and text entry boxes. When you add a click box, Captivate will convert every click you make during the recording process into a click box that the student must click to continue. When the text entry box is checked, Captivate converts your typing during recording into a text entry box that the student must type into in order to continue. In the Defaults category on the left, you can change the styles used for the objects. If you decide you don't like the default styles or have a specific branding you want to create, you may want to create your own style for the captions. Once you've created your own styles, you can choose which style you want to use from the drop-down. Now that you know how to record a simulation and change the preferences, practice using your section exercise document and storyboard. In the next lesson, you'll learn how to edit the simulation. You can spend more time editing than actually recording, so it's important you know your options. This lesson focuses on the features to help you edit your simulation with text typing, mouse movements, objects and backgrounds, adding additional recording slides, and importing into another project. If you make a mistake in your typing while recording, you can change the typing text to an animation. On the timeline, unlock the typing text, then right-click on it and select Replace with Text Animation. Double-click on the text animation to bring up the Properties panel and make your edits, then click OK. You can also change the movement of the mouse click and look of the mouse. To move the mouse click, click and drag the mouse cursor to where you want it. You want to change the initial mouse position on the first slide, you can click and drag the four red dots. If you want to change the mouse position on any other slide, you must change the mouse cursor on the previous slide. If you have a slide where you don't want the mouse to move at all, right-click on the mouse and select Align to Previous Slide or Align to Next Slide. If you want to hide the mouse, right-click on it and deselect Show Mouse. If you decide you don't want the mouse in the entire project, select all the slides in the film strip, right-click, select Mouse, and deselect Show Mouse. To change how the mouse looks, go to the Properties panel and select the type of mouse you want. Each screen capture is saved as a background image. Go to your library to view all the background images. If you need to edit the background with a photo editing software, you can right-click on the image and select Edit With or you can export the image to a folder on your computer by selecting the export icon. If you decide you simply need to copy the background onto another slide, right-click on the slide in the film strip and select Copy Background. Then select the slide you want, right-click again to select Paste as Background. To edit the captions, click on them and make the changes in the Properties panel. If you make a change to a caption type that you like, click Save and the changes will be applied to all the captions of that style in the project. By default, the click boxes only cover where you clicked your mouse during recording. So click and drag the click box to the exact location and ensure it covers the entire area. In the Properties panel under Action, Notice that by default, if the student clicks in the correct area, the success is to go to next slide. If the student doesn't click in the correct area, the slide continues until it reaches the pause indicator on the click box. You can see that on the timeline. And then the slide pauses. 
If you made a mistake and need to record additional slides, select the Record icon in the Control Panel or go to Insert in the main toolbar, Recording Slide. Choose the slide that the new recording slides will go after, click OK, then configure your capture settings. Click Record, capture your slides as you did before, and press End when you're ready to stop. To import a simulation into another project, select all the slides in the film strip, right click and select Copy, then go to your other project and paste the slides after the slide you want. Now open your exercise simulation and make any editing adjustments using your section exercise document and storyboard as a guide. You'll learn how to record a video demo in the next lesson. One of the many new and exciting features of Adobe Captivate 6 is the ability to create high-definition videos, which is seamless full-motion recording that works more like a single movie than a film strip. In this lesson, you'll learn the fast-track way of recording, editing, and publishing video demos. With the project open, select File in the main toolbar, then Record New Video Demo. Configure the recording settings, which we reviewed in Lesson 2 of this section. Adjust the red recording frame, if needed, and decide if you want to use narration. Click Record. Perform the steps of the procedures you are demonstrating, then press End on your keyboard or click the Captivate icon in your system tray. You'll go directly to the preview mode and the movie will start playing automatically. If you're happy with your recording, publish it by clicking on the Publish icon in the lower right-hand corner or publish directly to YouTube. But if you want to correct errors and or add some bells and whistles to your video, click Edit in the lower right-hand corner. When I do this, notice that in the top left, the Captivate extension is a .cpvc. Let's save this video demo by clicking File Save As. We're currently in the 100% view, so let's change this so that it's best fit. Notice that your movie appears on a single timeline at the bottom. You can stop and start playing your video by using your spacebar on your keyboard or clicking the Play Pause button. To quickly view the video, click and drag the red line. That's called the scrubber. To trim a section out of the middle, look on the bottom and click on the Trim button. Then on the timeline, grab the sliders and drag either side to highlight the area you want to remove. Then click Trim again. You can insert objects onto your video by going to the main toolbar and select Insert. You can even insert a picture inside a picture, a video inside a video. Select the object you want. With the object selected, you can edit the object in the Properties panel just like you would in any other Captivate project. You may want to add transitions to your movie. At the beginning and end of your timeline, notice there's a diagonal shape. This is a marker. Click on it, and in the Transition pane on the right, select the type of transition you desire. To zoom into a specific area of your screen, place your scrubber on the timeline to where you want to add the effect. On the bottom, click the Pan and Zoom button. In the Properties panel, drag the corners of the blue frame to where you want to zoom into. To change the speed of the zoom, drag the speed slider. To zoom back out, move the scrubber on your timeline to where you want it, and then in the Properties panel, select Zoom Out. When you've made your finishing touches, publish the video as an MP4. In the Application bar, select the Publish icon. Ensure the name is correct and the folder you want it published in is correct. Then select the preset drop-down to view your options. Let's select YouTube Widescreen HD. Then click Publish. To insert the video into your exercise project, open your project, go to the slide you want to insert it into, and in the main toolbar, select Video, Insert Video. Keep Multi-Synchronized Video selected. Browse to your video. It also can be distributed over several slides. In this case, we'll select Modify Slide Duration to accommodate slide, and we'll keep it on the stage, although you have the option of placing it in the Table of Contents. Click OK. Now take some time to practice creating a video demo. In this section, you've learned how to create and edit software simulations and videos. 
In the next section, we'll focus on using audio in your e-learning projects. So far, you've learned how to use visual assets and how to add basic interactions to your project. Now it's time to learn about adding audio. There are different types of audio you can add, such as voiceover narration, sound effects, and background music. And you have options of adding audio to specific objects, slides, or the entire project. In this section, you'll learn about importing audio, recording narration, and applying text-to-speech and closed captions. Lesson 1 focuses on how to import audio into your project. Background audio can play across slides and can be used along with narration. To import background music into your project, in the application bar at the top, select the Add Background icon. You can record your own background audio, or you can select Import, and you'll automatically be taken to the Adobe Gallery Sound folder that has some background music you can choose from. Select the audio file by double-clicking or click Open. From here, you can play the audio. If you want the audio to fade in or fade out, you can change these settings here. Looping the audio means that it will play over and over throughout the project. And you can use the slider to adjust the volume if desired. Then click Save. Be aware that background audio can be distracting to students, so if you use it at all, use it with a purpose. You may want to add audio to specific objects to add a sound effect or provide feedback. To add audio to an object, select the object you want to import the audio to. In the menu bar, select Audio, Import to, Object. Find and select the file you want. Click Open. If the audio is longer than the object is on the timeline, you'll be asked if you want to extend the time of the object. Typically, you'll click Yes if you want all the audio to be heard. Notice on the timeline now the object has an audio icon attached to it. To remove the audio or edit the audio, right-click and select Audio. To import audio to one or more slides, select the slide you want. Click Audio, Import to, Slide. Navigate to your project folder and select the audio folder. If the length of the timeline is not as long as the audio, you'll receive a dialog box asking you to choose from some options. Show the slide for the same amount of time as the length of the audio file means that the timeline will automatically adjust to fit the audio. Distribute the audio file over several slides will import the audio to the one slide and another dialog box will pop up allowing you to manually split the audio across several slides. Retain current length of slide duration and distribute the audio files over several slides means that if you use this, Captivate will split the audio based on the slide length you currently have for each slide and distribute the audio accordingly. Now take a little time to practice importing audio into your project using your section exercise document and storyboard. In the next lesson, you'll learn about how to record audio narration. Recording your own voiceover or using a voice talent is an effective way to increase student comprehension in your e-learning projects. In this lesson, you'll learn how to record your own narration. Before you record audio, you need to check the settings. Go to Audio in the main toolbar and select Settings. Click on the drop-down to select the audio device you will be using to speak into. The settings you choose here determine how the audio is compressed when published. Bitrate determines how many points along the sound wave curve are captured. The more points, the better the quality. For voiceovers, variable bitrate will likely give you a similar quality as constant bitrate, but with a smaller file size. Constant bitrate is typically used with voiceovers, and 96 kilobytes per second provides good compression and quality. To calibrate your microphone for the best volume levels, click Calibrate Input, then click Auto Calibrate, and speak into your microphone until you see the Input Level OK message. Click OK. To record audio to a slide, select the slide in your film strip, 
Then in the Application Control Panel, select the Record icon. If you've added slide notes, click the Captions and Slide Notes button on the bottom, increase the size of the font if desired, and then click the red button on the top to record. Speak into your microphone, click the Stop button when you're ready, and then click the Save button. Click Close. To record across multiple slides, click Audio, Record to, Slides. Change the range of the slides if needed, click OK. If you want to see the slide preview, click SWF Preview, and if you have slide notes, click the Captions and Slide Notes button. Click the Record button, speak into your mic for the first slide, then click the Stop button, click the Next Slide arrow, and repeat until all the slides are completed. As you add audio to your slides, you'll notice that it inserts at the bottom of your timeline. If you right-click on it, you have some options here, including removing it or finding it in the library where you have some additional options. You can play it from the library window by clicking on the play button in the top right hand corner. You can also use any of the icons here to update or even export it. And if you right click on the audio file, you have some other options such as renaming it. It's always a good idea to rename your audio in your library. Also notice on the film strip, you'll see an audio icon at the bottom of the slide. This is a visual clue letting you know there is audio on that slide. To record audio, don't rely on your computer's internal microphone. Invest in a decent microphone and or headset. Recording professional sounding narration is an advanced technique to learn. However, there are some amazing audio experts such as Rick Zanotti with Relate and many video tutorials on YouTube, in addition to the Adobe Captivate blog which offers tutorials on a variety of audio topics. Now it's time to practice your own recording techniques. Writing a good script and recording narration takes time and practice. Don't expect to get it right the first time, but it's okay because in the next lesson you'll learn about basic audio editing. Now that you've learned how to import and record audio, you should know how to use the editing features. In this lesson, you'll learn about the audio editing settings and adding and or deleting portions of audio files. To edit the audio for the entire project, select Audio, Edit, Project. You'll get a pop-up warning you that closed captions will be disabled. One reason to leave closed captions until the very end. Click Yes. When the audio editing pop-up opens, slide the zoom slider so you can view all of your slides. Click the SWF radio button to see the visual image of the current slide you're on. To change where the audio enters on a slide, click your cursor in the timeline where you want the audio to transition, then select the Start Next Slide at Cursor Position icon. You can also click and drag the slide dividers. To delete a section of audio, click and drag your mouse in the waveform to select the audio you want to remove, then click the Delete icon. To insert silence, use your mouse cursor to click in the timeline where you want to add the silence, then click the Insert Silence icon. Decide how many seconds you want to insert and click OK. To cut, copy, and paste audio, select the audio you want in the waveform and click the Cut or Copy icon. Then click in the waveform where you want the audio to be inserted and click Paste. To adjust the volume, select the Adjust Volume button at the bottom, click and drag the volume slider up or down. To normalize means that Captivate will automatically adjust the audio to maintain a consistent volume between slides. Use Dynamics to let Captivate manage volume variations based on the ratio and threshold. Ratio determines how loud to make the quietest sections, while Threshold regulates the level of sound that shouldn't be amplified, such as background noise. To record additional audio, click where you want the audio to go in the waveform and click the Record button. It will not record over what you already have. If you want to replace the audio you already have, select the Add Replace button on the top to record your new audio. To import a new audio file into the waveform, select Import and navigate to the file. 
If you've already imported audio into your project's library, select the Library button and then select the file and click OK. In the Properties panel of the slide that has audio, under the Audio tab, you have a few additional options here too, such as fading in and fading out, looping the audio, stopping the background audio if you have it, and editing or removing audio. If you click the Edit Audio, this box is editing the audio just for this slide. If you have the eLearning Suite, you can choose to edit the audio with Adobe Audition. You'll be taken directly into the Audition software, make the changes, and when you click Save, it automatically updates in Adobe Captivate. In other words, you don't have to export and import the audio to edit with another software. Also notice the Closed Caption button option at the top. You'll be learning about closed captions in the next lesson. But before you begin the next lesson, take some time to practice using Adobe Captivate's editing options. If you don't want to record your own narration, Captivate offers the ability to use text-to-speech, which is an automated voice option. Additionally, you can add closed captions for students who would rather read than hear text content and for accessibility purposes. To convert your text into text-to-speech, you should have the script in the Slide Notes panel for each slide. In an earlier lesson, we already added some slide notes, but if you can't see them, click in the Slide Notes box. Then check the Text-to-Speech radio button. Then click the Text-to-Speech button. If you haven't downloaded the installation software, on the bottom of the pop-up, there's a Click Here to Download option. Once it's downloaded, then you can select the voice option you desire from the speech agent. If there's already a speech agent assigned, click to highlight it here and then click the drop-down to select a different speech agent. You must click Generate Audio every time you either change the speech agent or change the script in the slide notes. Then click Close. Notice that the text-to-speech audio is placed on the bottom of the slide's timeline. You can add additional slide notes and use different speech agents for each. To add slide notes, click the plus sign on the right and then type in or copy-paste your script. To rearrange the order of the slide notes, you can click and drag them. Then click the Text-to-Speech Radio button, and then click the Text-to-Speech button. If you want to change a speech agent, make sure you click Generate Audio. To save development time, you may want to generate the audio files for the entire project using the Speech Management window. First, make sure you mark the radio button for the text-to-speech in the slide notes on every slide, and then go to the main toolbar, Audio, Speech Management, and you can change the speech agent here and generate the audio for all of them at once. Closed captions makes your e-learning accessible to students who can't hear. It's also useful to others who just prefer to read. As with text-to-speech, closed captions are associated with the slide notes. Check the Audio Closed Caption Radio button, then click the Closed Caption button. If you have more than one closed caption per slide, drag the marker in the waveform to where you want each caption to begin. To change the closed caption settings, click the Closed Caption Project Settings button. Enter the number or drag your mouse to change the number of lines that show up at one time. Click the color swatch to pick the color and transparency of the overlay area, and then decide on the font size and color. Click OK. Click Save, and then click Close. There is one more thing you have to do. The default setting for closed caption is turned off, so you'll have to go to Project, Skin Editor, and check the Closed Captioning button. Then exit out. Now preview your slide. When creating your content on slides, consider the space used for closed captions at the bottom of the slide. Avoid showing anything important in that space. Now open your Captivate project to practice using text-to-speech and adding closed captions. Now that you've learned many features of Adobe Captivate to create and manage e-learning content, it's time to publish your projects, and that's what you'll be learning in the next section. With the sound recorded, edited, and closed captions attached, your fast track to Adobe Captivate 6 and building your first e-learning course is almost complete.
However, there are a few final touches that you need to know before publishing. In this section, you'll learn about the settings and features that influence your final project. But let's start the first lesson with the project skins that includes the border and playback controls. The skin editor is a collection of elements that are displayed around the slide used to enhance the user experience, but aren't part of the content. To configure the playback controls, in the main toolbar, go to Project Skin Editor. Select the drop-down to view your skins that come with Captivate for rapid development. But show Play Bar Control is on by default. If you don't want the student to view the toolbar that controls features of the movie, deselect it. Check Hide Play Bar in Quiz if you don't want the Play Bar to show on Quiz Question Slides. If you click Play Bar Overlay, as you can see in the preview pane, the Play Bar appears on the slide, covering up part of the content area. Show Play Bar on Hover means that if the student's mouse is inactive for greater than two seconds, the Play Bar will disappear. Select the style of Play Bar from the drop down menu. Widgets offer you more interactive options of Play Bars. Click this link, which will open the widget pane in the Properties panel to view other styles. When you click Play Bar Two Rows, the buttons appear on one row and the Seek Bar on the bottom row. You can customize your own button colors by clicking within the color box and using the color swatches. And you can change where you want the play bar to position on your slide and indicate the size and more specific position using the layout drop down. Then decide which buttons you want to show in the play bar, and if you want the play bar to be somewhat transparent, you can lower the alpha number here. Tool tips are hints, so when the student rolls their mouse over one of the play bar icons, it provides a tip explaining what that button is for. If you've made these custom changes, you can click the Save As icon at the top on the right of Skin, name it, and then it will appear in the drop down for later courses. Underneath the skin, you'll notice the three icons. We're currently in the playback control on the left. The middle icon is the border, which configures the outside area of your movie. Check Show Border if you want a border around your project and click the buttons for each side that you want the border on. Choose if you want square or rounded edges and how wide you want the border to be. There are quite a few options of pre customized textures to choose from, or if you want just a plain color, select Non under Texture and then pick the color from the color swatch. The HTML background is the color of the background area around the project on the web page. It doesn't show up well here in this preview. But if you preview in your web browser, you'll see how it appears. The third feature in the project skin is the table of contents, which you'll be learning more about in the next lesson. So you've chosen to have playback controls. Now you'll need to decide if you want the students to view a table of contents. To open the table of contents directly, go to Project Table of Contents. By default, the TOC is off. If you want to show the table of contents to your students, click the radio button. If you've grouped and named your slides, when you open the TOC the very first time, the slide group name will appear as a heading and the slides in that group are subcategorized automatically underneath. However, when you close the table of contents window to return to your project and you make edits such as changing the slide names or adding slides, you'll need to use the reset TOC at the bottom in order to update the names of the slides. Alternatively, you can double click inside the title and change the name manually. If you want to change where the slide appears in the table of contents, use the controls at the bottom to create new folders and use the arrows to move the slides inside the folder. The information button opens a box to add project information that will appear at the top portion of your table of contents. You can also add a logo and change the font settings for each line independently. The Settings button brings up another dialog box providing you with more options. 
separate means that the table of contents will be to one side or the other permanently, making your course size larger, something to take into consideration when determining your course size. Choose Overlay if you want the table of contents to hide and show only if the student clicks the TOC icon. Change the transparency using the alpha percent. Under the Runtime options, Collapse All will minimize the folders in the table of contents when the student enters the course. If this is unchecked, the folders will be expanded. Self-paced learning will allow the students to return to the same place they left off if they exit the course and return to it. When the status flag is checked, a check mark will appear to the right of each title as the student completes the slide. Under the theme heading, you can once again customize your own colors and font for each level. Before publishing, there are a few other features you should be familiar with. To Find and Replace, select Edit, Find and Replace. The pane will appear at the bottom of the Properties panel and you can make the changes you need. For Spell Check, go to Project, check Spelling. It's best not to have to rescale a project, but if you need to, go to Modify, Rescale, and depending on if you're rescaling to a larger or smaller size, you'll be provided with some other options. Practice using your exercise section document to work with the skin editor, and in the next lesson, you'll learn about even more features that contribute to the publishing process. The Project Preferences dialog box has several categories that affect your final published project. In this lesson, you'll learn about the preferences for project information, SWF size and quality, publish settings, and start and end features. To open up the Project Preferences on a Mac, go to Adobe Captivate in the main toolbar and select Preferences. On a PC, go to Edit Preferences. In the category on the left under Project, you'll see four options. The information you enter here serves two purposes. One, you can use it as a placeholder with system variables to pull information into your project at any time. And two, the information is used as metadata, making your project accessible to people using assistive devices such as screen readers, braille, or text-to-speech utilities. Under the SWF Size and Quality category, when publishing your project, you want to balance between the quality of the slides and the overall size of the project. If you have video in your course, you should definitely select Compress Full Motion Recording SWF File. To change the level of the quality for audio, video, and images all together, use the slider. Or select Custom to change the individual settings. Check Retain the individual slide quality if you want each slide to retain the quality you selected. But if you want all slides to have one setting, uncheck Retain slide quality settings and then choose High or Low bitrate. Change the audio quality by clicking on Settings here and type in the image quality percent if you like. It's a good idea to keep advanced project compression and compress SWF file checked so the output renders smoothly. Under the category Publish Settings on the left, typically videos are created at 30 frames per second. But if you're importing videos with a different frames per second, you may need to change this here. Check Publish Adobe Connect metadata if you're using Adobe Connect as your learning management system. The rest of these are selected as the default and you'll typically want to keep them all checked. Externalizing these resources can help keep your file size smaller, but unless you have a very slow internet service, you'll probably want to keep these resources within your project. Under the Start and End category, if you don't want your published movie to start playing automatically, uncheck Auto Play. A preloader is a small image or animation that plays while the movie is downloading to let your audience know that they have to wait. And you can browse Adobe Captivate's preloaders and choose one from the NUS Gallery preloaders, or you can use a custom logo or animation. 
It's a good idea to change the percent of your preloader to a lower percent so that your audience can start viewing your course before it's downloaded in its entirety. And then decide if you want a password or expiry date. Choose if you want the first slide to fade in. If you want something else to happen when the movie ends, click the action drop down and make your selection. Before you publish any project, double check your project preferences. Take a few minutes now to practice changing the project settings before starting the next lesson. Lesson 4 covers quiz reporting preferences. A learning management system, or LMS, offers various services to students and agencies to deliver, enroll, track, and manage web based training. A published Captivate course can be integrated into almost every LMS available on the market. Before going to the quiz reporting settings, you need to decide which interactions to include in the report to the LMS. Quiz question reporting is on by default under the quiz properties panel of the question slide in the reporting tab. You can see that the report answers is checked with an interaction ID number attached. If you deselect the report answers, the LMS will not include this quiz question in the report. If you want to set your own unique interaction ID here, you can type it in. Additionally, click boxes, buttons, and text entry boxes can be reported to the LMS. Select the button, and in the Properties panel, under the Reporting tab, you can decide if you want to include this interaction in the LMS report and attach a unique interaction ID to it. After every interaction that you want to report has its own interaction ID, it's time to enable and configure the quiz reporting settings under Preferences. Even if you don't have a quiz included, you can choose to enable reporting for the other interactive objects or just for a course completion status. Then choose a standard. There are a variety of LMSs to choose from. The options vary depending on which standard you choose. To understand more about which LMSs are validated, click the link at the bottom. We're going to stick with SCORM 1.2. Configure provides details about your movie that will be delivered to your project's manifest to communicate with the LMS. Some of this information may be used to display the course information to the student. The SCO stands for Shared Content Object and may be used in the pop-up title of the LMS. I typically type in here, click here to begin in the title. The template is typically used as the default. Your particular LMS may require a complete status or a past fail status under the status representation. If you select user access, the course is considered complete as soon as it's launched by the student. To base completion on the amount of slides or the status of the quiz, enter the percent of the slides that the student needs to view to receive a completed status or the number of slides. If you have a quiz, select one of the options from the drop-down. Choose if you want to send the raw score or the percent score for the quiz. Select interaction data if you want to include data about the individual questions as well as the overall quiz results. While the course is opening, you can type in the text you want to appear under the LMS initiation text. Take some time now to change your quiz reporting settings based on your exercise document. Your course will then be ready to be published and reported to the LMS. And in the next lesson, you'll learn about the various publishing options. There are just a few more options you should know about before opening the publish window. In this lesson, you'll learn about publishing to HTML5, YouTube, Swift, and PDFs. Publishing to HTML5 is one of the new exciting features of Adobe Captivate 6 and allows you to publish to mobile devices such as iPads and iPhones without using Flash. But because it's an emerging technology, not all features are fully supported yet. Go to Window HTML5 Tracker to open the panel which lets you know the slides that have objects that are not supported because they are Flash-based. 
Before opening the Publishing Options panel, you can also publish your movie directly to YouTube. Click the YouTube Ready icon in the Control Panel and it will take you through the login process. Understand that your YouTube videos are converted from Swift flash files to MP4 files and therefore any interactions are not supported. To publish your project, click the Publish icon in the Control Panel. The default window is the SWF HTML5 window. The project title will automatically take on the name of your saved project. And from here, you can browse to the folder that you want your saved project to be published in. Click SWF to publish to Flash, and also an HTML file will automatically be generated. Click HTML5 to play on mobile devices. If you check both SWF and HTML5 and upload both, the server will recognize which file to run based on the type of device the student is using. Under Output Options, click Zip if you want Captivate to generate a compressed folder. This is good for uploading to LMSs. Select Full Screen if you want the HTML files to open at maximum size. Click Generate Auto Run for CD if you're placing your finished project on a CD and want the published file to run automatically. Select the Flash Player version from the dropdown. It's a good idea to select the lowest version and check Export to PDF to create a PDF document. Good for emailing or reviews. You can see your project information in the box on the right side, and if you need to return to your project preferences to make changes, you can click the Preferences button. If you publish multiple times, Captivate detects the changes and republishes only those changes unless you click this Force Republish All Slides box. If you want your published project to scale based on the size of the student screen, click the Scalable HTML Content box. And when you're ready, click Publish. You can finally publish your project and make your e-learning course available to your audience. In the next and final lesson, you'll learn about other publishing options. Wonderful! Now you've published your first e-learning project. And in this lesson, you'll learn even more about other publishing options. Open the Publish window and take a look at the left side of your screen. If you're publishing to Adobe Connect, you can select Adobe Connect and there's some options here. The Media option lets you publish your project in formats other than the Swift format, such as Windows and Mac executable and MP4. Understand that these options remove any interactivity that you have in your project and publish just like videos. The email option allows you to publish using the format of your choice and then your default email browser automatically opens with the file attached. The FTP can be used to publish and send your file directly to a website via file transfer protocol. You can publish using the format of your choice. The Print option allows you to publish various types into Word documents and provides a short description and options based on the type you choose. In this section, you've learned about final considerations as part of the publishing process. In this course, you've become familiar with how to add and manage slides, how to add and manage standard and interactive objects, how to create training simulations and HD demo videos, and you've imported and recorded your own audio. With your project published, Fast Track to Adobe Captivate 6 is complete. Congratulations! You should now be feeling confident to create and publish more e-learning and m-learning projects. Of course, there's so much more to learn using this sophisticated tool. So when you're ready, stay tuned for more video tutorials of advanced features using Adobe Captivate. I'm Anita Horsley and I'd like to say thank you for watching and I hope you'll join us again for more tutorials from Pact Publishing.